Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are here for the second part of the Taylor Shipp business trial. It is Thursday, July 27th. It is the morning stream. Law nerds, it's good to see you. I've got a whole tankard of coffee plus a lot of water. We got to hydrate while we caffeinate, especially for long days in court. My, um, my least favorite thing as an attorney was being on time to court. So, um, you know, here we are. Here we are today. So I'm going to give you kind of a breakdown of what we're doing today, and then we'll pop into court. The first thing we're going to see this morning is argument over whether or not a particular expert will come in. We are in the second part of this trial. Taylor Shipp Business was convicted yesterday, found guilty in like 40 minutes of all charges against her, including first degree murder. But because she pled not guilty and not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, the jury now has to decide. They decided she did the thing and that she had the intent to do the thing. They now have to decide if she can be held responsible for the thing. I call it the penalty phase. Some call it the responsibility phase. Why do I call it the penalty phase? Well, this is determining the penalty that she is going to suffer. Will she be in prison for the rest of her life without parole? Or will she be in a uh, mental health treatment facility as determined by the court where if she is treated and is um, no longer a danger to herself or the community, she could be released. That is a possibility. That is what the fight is over in this trial. What an expert can't do is make broad generalizations. Hey, sometimes people do this. This needs to be a this defendant has this thing that made her not be able to appreciate what she did here. For the second phase of trial, the defense bears the burden. So this is a affirmative defense and the defense must establish, and I'm reading it directly from the code in Wisconsin, the defense must establish to a reasonable certainty by the greater weight of credible evidence. This is not beyond a reasonable doubt. This is much lower of a standard than beyond a reasonable doubt. Reasonable certainty by the greater weight of the evidence. More of a, a pon, uh, probability ponderance standard, so more likely. And the defense needs to prove that there is a mental disease or defect, but antisocial conduct by case law in Wisconsin does not count. So just looking at the horrificness of the crime here and saying that horrificness is not right. I get it. But antisocial conduct does not count. There has to be something more. And what the court is looking for here is someone who does not understand that they have committed a crime or does not understand that what they have done is wrong. So the, the court has to go through um, or the jury is going to have to decide those prongs, right? That the defendant lacked the mental capacity to have committed all the essential elements of the offense um, and, and that they really don't know. And you see this in cases where people don't know what they're doing is a um, is a crime. They don't know what they're doing is is an action against a defendant. They're not perceiving the world um, in the way it is actually playing out in reality. So that I don't think is what we saw here. And we saw this defendant try to hide their behavior by decapitating the defendant to hide the body after the murder. And I think that's going to be a big factor in all of this. We are waiting for court to start. So of course, I will get to some questions as we do that. Um, the jury won't be in till about 9.15. The judge wants to hear from the expert first and ordered the attorneys back about five minutes ago. This court has been seeming to start kind of right on time. So we will see when the court gets rolling. The court is not rolling yet, but when they do, we will go to court and they will be arguing over the experts. Again, the defense experts here, because the defense now bears the burden of proof, cannot just come in and say, well, people can have these responses. People sometimes do these things. I'm like, share your screen for the love. People can have these responses. People can do these things. It needs to be very specific 
to the defendant and the defendant is not present yet in court. I wonder if there is a delay bringing the defendant in because the defendant, the defense counsel is at counsel table, but the defendant is not yet in court. So this has to be a very specific thing. And again, when you're looking at um, mental health defenses, it can't be, well, people can sometimes do this. It has to be specific to this defendant. This defendant has this um, that has caused them to not be able to perceive what they're doing. So weed mom asked, could they say she had drug-induced psychosis? In most jurisdictions, voluntary intoxication does not count. So if it was, hey, she used meth this day under the influence of meth, this is how she was perceiving the world, is not going to count. If the argument is she has habitually used methamphetamine and it organically changed the underlying structure of her brain, and even when she is not under the influence, she is she is dealing with a, a organic brain damage, and when she's not under the influence, that still presents, that is different. So long-term drug use that causes organic damage, underlying damage, damage that's present even when you're not under the influence is different than being voluntarily under the influence and causing a problem. So um, Debbie Smith said she was sober enough to drive home. That's that's relative, <laughs> truly. I've seen a lot of really crazy uh, DUI cases um, uh, with alcohol and with narcotics and it, getting home at three o'clock in the morning when no one else on the road is on the road is a is a different definition of sober. But she was um, she was she was able to get home and able to communicate with police. It you guys can watch the um, the interview with uh, with police. It was uh yesterday in the morning that they played it so you can go and watch that if you're interested in the interview with law enforcement that shows um how she was by the time that police you know interviewed her and whether or not she was able to perceive the questions they would ask and and interact with them in and again in a way where she was um not too intoxicated to do that. So let's see. There's a couple other questions. Question, how do I get a gifted membership? Ah, the law, the mods can can kind of give you the directions on your account to do that. And let's see, what else? Would all the testing be done before trial? Yes, well before trial. So all of this has been done before trial. So since we are still waiting for court, I'm going to roll the intro. Law nerds, thank you for being here. For those of you that are new to this coverage, um, court is something that I do when there are cases that kind of fit with what I cover. And I, I love live court coverage. I do. Can somebody please tell me what the animal is at the top of this logo with the great, is that a beaver at the top of the, it says forward and then there is what animal what animal is this on the top of a log is this a beaver on the on the seal of the great state of wisconsin i i truly don't know i'm i'm very curious all right for those of you wisconsinites that know let us know i'm i love that we get to see so many state seals all the things we've learned i feel like we're in civics class it's a badger thank you chat beaver badger appreciate it badger is the state animal this makes sense this makes sense. I somewhere have a Wisconsin badger pen. This makes sense. Um, Bad Biscuit said platypus. I mean, wouldn't that be better? <laughs> badger, this badger, badger makes sense. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> Let's get into it. Emma, thank you for the 50 gifted memberships. That is incredibly generous. And I know those in the chat that are here early are the, the tried and true, the dedicated law nerds that are not just like passing by on the internet. They're like, we are here. Thank you very much for that. Katie, I saw your um, 
your super chat lady. I am so sorry. Um, my dad passed away yesterday. I'm very sorry to hear that. He was a litigation attorney and the reason I became interested in law, we talked about you, EDB, and the trials we were watching, Murdaugh, Depp v. Heard. It was a great bonding experience. I've heard that from a lot of you. I'm so glad we can bond over law. I'm so sorry for your loss. It is a, a unique and specific thing, losing a parent, and I'm sorry that you did. So we are, the law nerds are here for you. Um, Tinsley, I know you're not a morning person, but I won't lie. I love that I get to start my morning with you and the fellow law nerds. Tinsley, I appreciate you. I am generally not a morning person. However, I do love hanging out with y'all. I am not sure what the, this is odd for this court to not be started yet. Um, Jen said beaver is a Canadian animal. Isn't Wisconsin basically up up by Canada anyway, geographically? Aren't we aren't we northern at that point? Emily, geography is not your song shoot. No, it's not. Jenny, question, does she have a public defender? She does. This defendant does not have uh, private representation. However, I will say, because sometimes I feel like when people ask, Jenny, this is not you. This is the internet in general. When people ask, um, there can just be some judgment regarding public defenders. And here's what I want to say after, again, being, I, I am biased in this because I was a deputy district attorney. So most of the defense attorneys I worked with were public defenders. Public defenders do this work every single day, day in and day out. They are not just doing one type of case. They are not just doing misdemeanors. They take what is literally landing on their desk and show up and do the work. So when you have to look at a case. There are a lot of cases where a public defender may serve you better because they know the prosecutor and have likely done tons and tons and tons of cases with them. They know the judge. They know how juries in this jurisdiction react because they have done so many jury trials in that jurisdiction. It is a much different circumstance than some private attorneys that may have done three or four trials, not hundreds of, you know, well, it depends on the jurisdiction if we're getting into hundreds, but you know, thousands, that's ex excessive, but who have done as many trials okay. as they have. They are incredibly experienced attorneys. Saunders and District Attorney Jose, so. which businesses here as District Attorney And I will say, calendar, in private attorneys and public defenders, for a, uh, a Daubert type hearing, your uh, address, mileage may vary. Um, Dr. O'Donnell, who Mr. Uh, Freilich has submitted, expert uh, for the uh, responsibility phase. So, Mr. Freilich. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, well, the defense <clears throat> does have uh, Dr. Diane Litton, PhD, as an expert to uh, testify in phase two of this uh, trial, the NGI phase. Um, I did confer and uh, consult with Dr. James T. O'Donnell. Oh, he's not uh, even going to do it. Yesterday. Are you not going to do court it? To further talk about his opinions in this matter. Um, I've had a number of discussions with him. I know that he is a a pharmacologist this who has lots of experience and has testified as an expert in the field of uh, pharmacology in the past. I, like the um, I shared market. with him some of the concerns that the court had with regards to the four points of his uh, trial opinion that was discussed yesterday. The defense had retained him some time ago, and he did testify at a motion hearing, I there, believe, back better. in June uh, on issue, legal issues related to uh, the statements and other issues of that sort. Um, after further analysis, after further contemplation and They're not discussion, call him. Um, the defense has decided to uh, not call him in phase two of this proceeding based on the comments that uh, court the, made and the court made concerns that you can't. The court shared. We yep. do not believe that it would be uh, Prudent. helpful at this point in time. And so uh, we're going to not call him uh, at this uh, phase of the, of the case. Well, the jury's not back till 915. Okay. What are we going to um, do now? I respect that opinion or that decision rather, um, Mr. Freilich. I I want to indicate that I, I raised the concerns yesterday because I was very much interested in focusing any testimony uh, at this hearing today on areas where I thought uh, some um, testimony would need to be directed. I wasn't deciding what was going to happen at this hearing, um, so I just I just want to make clear I didn't no, no. make it. I didn't render a decision. That's why I'm here this morning to listen to testimony. Yeah, but no, I respect no. your decision to uh, to not call him. Um, and that's, that is your, that is your decision. And you're right. You have another expert that you're calling, yep. um, who has uh, already testified in this case as well. So, um, uh, well, there's no need for a hearing on that this morning. All right. Any so other issues? going to be in for another 45 minutes, so we can't get going. We have a little bit of extra time. 
Uh, Damn it! <laughs> but, um, a couple of things. Jury uh, instructions. Do the jury instructions. First of all, does the state have anything you want to share on, on that, Mr. Saunders? No. Okay. A um, couple of things. Um, I was asked by security uh, this morning, Mr. Fralick, about whether um, your client will be testifying. Close or whether simply the jail scrubs was fine. Frankly, I, I think the answer probably is she could have come in in jail scrubs because um, guilt has been established. Seating we're at. On the other hand, I, I didn't care one way or the other. I'm sure security would have preferred it the other way, but I see that she's here in street clothes. Um, and that's uh, something that you wanted, Mr. Fred. She's still in front of the jury. Yes, you are. That's fair. Um, all right. So that's been accomplished, and we'll, we'll do it that way. Um, yeah, and that ship has sailed, Your Honor. The, uh, when the jury returns, um, I think all I would do is give them instruction um, 603. Um, and I don't know if the parties have that in front of you. If you don't, I'll get you a copy of it. But uh, 603. Um, 603 has a few um, what I'll call options. Um, the first option is um, if the first phase was resolved with the plea of a, a guilty or no contest. Um, Which I guess is an option here. And then and that did not happen here. Insert the elements that didn't occur in this case. So the only uh, the only change well, I would they allow suggest it. making to 603 is that uh, the defendant has been found guilty of and then list the offenses as I've done um, in these instructions uh, so far and then indicate we will now proceed with the second phase of the trial. During the second phase, you will be asked to determine whether the defendant is now responsible by reason of mental disease or defect, and then continue to That's read the that instruction. Um, first of all, I, I saw when I mentioned about uh, whether Just, or not you had it in front of you, you nodded, Mr. Saunders, you have it in front of you. No, I don't. I you reviewed it this morning. Well, let me make. Uh, we can just. Which is why I, I say penalty well. phase. I've got it in my binder. Because she's still convicted. Copy. Thank you, Judge. Though it's phrasing you would typically hear in like a death penalty case when they're deciding between death and life. Here they're be deciding between mental health treatment and life. For me, it's a similar responsibility phase penalty phase the consequence of this part of the trial is where she's going to spend her time so I'll and how mr Frelick, because you have it you probably looked at it as i've been talking any objection to my sending out 603 out in that fashion makes sense your honor mr saunders no objection okay uh, so that's what i'll do and then um i guess the only other issue is uh, uh the order of questioning i know the burden of proof now shifts to the, to the defense, defense. they should go first the party with the burden of proof goes first yep. although this is kind of one of cases where the state generally is perceived as going first um mr saunders preference no i agree i, I think the defense, uh, the defense go has first. the burden so they would start yes the statement we would respond and then they would call witnesses mr Freilich? uh that makes sense as well i believe in talking to mr lisset at the end at closing then i would have the rebuttal yes so that makes sense so that's what we'll do um and um i'm going to Keep you under the same time frames I had. Oh, these uh, openings are going to be so for, short. Uh, openings and closings uh, during the uh, guilt phase of the trial. Okay. Anything else to take mental up? disease I'll go, I'll go and defect is the that, uh, legal terminology. Instruction. Anything else to bring up? We'll talk about Saunders. that in a second. Uh, I don't know if the court also wants to read the, the opening statement instruction two after uh, six o three. I don't know. Um, if it's necessary or not, but I can. That, okay. Um, that uh, that is not a, any objection to that, Mr. Freilich. Is no, no, you are. Okay, I'll get the opening uh, the opening statement instruction. These attorneys um, have worked the proposed really, really hard and really well uh, together, but they're just like sparse as to what they suggest we need. So they are just zipping uh, along in frankly, this trial. At the end as well, uh, there's there's uh, six oh five, um, but nonetheless, we'll talk about that later. I'll get the opening instruction. Uh, the opening statement instruction. I'll read 603 first, then I'll read the opening statement instruction, and we'll go from there. Anything else, Mr. Saunders? No, thank you. Mr. Freilich, anything else? Nothing else. Thank you. Okay, well, the jury will be in at, at 9.15, so uh, we have a little bit of time. Yeah, we do. And, um, we'll be back on the record at 9.15.
We're in recess. Curse all of you that made me get up so early to blow dry my hair. Not you, the parties in court. But the judge needed to give the defense attorney time to have that hearing if needed. It was not needed. Um, the defense looked at everything and looked at what the court said and went, well, that's not going to work. So we are going to talk about this case, answer questions, and I'll keep the screen up while we do that. The, if the jury's back early, they might come back faster. So Amy G was talking about NGI, which is not guilty by reason of insanity. They changed the word insanity to mental disease or defect. This is the more updated um, acknowledgement that insanity maybe is not the most um, A, modern, and B, proper legal terminology for what is a, a men mental disease and whether or not somebody is, um, is psychotic to the point that they don't even perceive what they are doing that is a circumstance where the law says if you don't know you were committing murder can you be held responsible for committing murder if what you thought you were doing was something completely different so the law does update i mean albeit slowly but i don't know another way in court to um to really encompass what this defense is for however jurors tend to see through um tend to see through these defenses when they find there are not defenses is is it possible that where this case will end up is just with a jury saying meth is awful but you chose to use meth and do an awful thing and you're responsible for that yes so could they have um let her plea the court said yes you know there's a jury instruction that says when this is accomplished by plea saying yes i did the act but no i didn't perceive what i was doing which again is kind of contrary to me because admitting that you did the thing and then being like but i didn't really know it was the thing is a is a, a strange contradiction to me so um question does disassociation fit into mental disease or defect i would have to look at case law but um i i think you would be able to present a defense it has to be a diagnosable issue and what we're going to see today is experts from both sides coming in and arguing arguing about this and we're going to have a conversation it's why i wanted to cover this phase of the trial a we don't see televised particularly a lot of ngi parts of a trial we definitely don't get two parts like this normally the NGI is kind of determined at the same time as guilt. So having it in a two-phase trial is different for this jurisdictions. Um, and I think there's a really interesting legal conversation and a conversation that's not always understood about a, a lot of different things. One, antisocial behavior does not count for NGI. Two, voluntary intoxication does not count for NGI. So those are going to factor in those are gonna factor in heavily here. Um, because is this defendant someone who truly cannot um, perceive what they did was right or wrong? Based on all the evidence in this case, at this point, and again, we are not to this point of the trial yet, and for another 30 minutes, I am trying to keep an open mind. But at this point, all of the things she did seems to indicate that she knew that this was bad that this was uh that this was a crime and she was trying to hide it so i think it's going to be hard for the jury to find that her behavior is something she can't be held responsible for i because it seems that she knew what she was doing and she knew what um she knew what she was doing and she knew what happened uh, Sarah said, wait, where'd it go? Meth is a choice, psychosis isn't. I agree psychosis isn't. But if if that is happening while under the influence of meth because of the meth use, it's not going to count because it's voluntary intoxication. If it is long-term use that has led to an issue, that is different. But there has to be underlying provable um, brain damage. Monuments of speculation. Can one claim MGI when actions were taken to conceal the crime? She can claim it. 
and that's what she's doing, she has the right to plea this way. It doesn't mean the jury is going to agree. And we have to see what the experts say. I saw a number of questions about who pays for these experts. The, oh, I am, I am now in the way. The experts are paid for by the state. So the state can appoint under statute up to three experts. Um, the state pays for the experts. So have they done a brain scan? I don't know. We're going to hear what the psychiatrists say. Um, let's take a minute and reset. Is there a verdict? Yes, there was a verdict yesterday. And there will probably be another verdict today. Let's take a second and reset. But before we reset all the way, we're going to thank the sponsor for today's stream. Yes, we are. That's what we're doing. There are almost 9,000 of you here. You guys know how much I love my Gerard Cosmetics Lip Glosses. This, I was gonna grab a prettier one, but this is real life. This is the one that was in my purse because it's almost empty again <laughs> because I use them so much. I don't know where my hearsay went. I think it is in a different purse from when I went to Dave, but you can see how much I use these. I absolutely love my Lonard collab with Gerard Cosmetics, but it is National Lipstick Day at Gerard Cosmetics today. All single lip products are $10. That includes the Lonard glosses and all of your other favorites. You know that I also love, there are others that I love. I mean, they don't have the fun purple top, but this is Rose Hill. It's one that I wear often that you guys ask about. So, you know, I'm partial to my purple top, but those are for our collab. So these are all $10. If you still want to use your Law Nerd code, you can use code Law Nerd Law Nerds to get 30% off all other products. So if you go in and you're like, well, we need to get shipping, then you've got it. So glitter lipsticks, traditional lip glosses, pencils, plumpers, liquid lipsticks are all on sale. This Emily, did you bring things into your office to talk about this today? No, this is what sits on my desk. This is what sits on my desk every time I stream. Share the lip pencil and these lip glosses. The purple is in my purse. These are my streaming. This is my streaming toolkit. There you go. <laughs> All of those are on sale over at Gerard Cosmetics. The link is in the chat. So um, let's see. T-Dubs in the chat said... I've never had a lip gloss that was so pretty and smooth, but not sticky. Yes. And that's, and that's what, that's the first thing that drew me in. Second thing is I love Jen. It is a woman owned business. It is, you know, she is here in the States, which I also love. I love the light on the lip gloss. I love the mirror on the back of the lip gloss. I love all the things. I love all, I love all of it. I love that the other day when I dropped it at, from quite quite a height, um, the lid popped off and I was able to pop it back on myself and it stayed. Like, I love everything about it. I really do. So, y'all, if you're interested in that, I'll remind you later on in stream, Gerard Cosmetics. Let's reset where we're at today for trial, shall we? Here's a little bit of a reset. Yesterday, Taylor Business was found guilty of all three charges. The three charges in this case were first degree intentional homicide, which is Sorry, did you say that again? no Siri, but maybe first degree intentional homicide, which is interesting because in some jurisdictions, if somebody can't be held responsible for what they're doing, it's found that they couldn't form the requisite intent or the mens rea of the crime. Like they couldn't form the intent to kill due to the NGI. So different states approach NGI in a different way and find, look, they did the act, but they didn't have the requisite mental state, so they can't be punished the same way, even though they did the act. That is not how Wisconsin's rolling. Wisconsin's like, hey, if you find the act and the mental state, then we can get to whether or not um, she perceived that what she was doing was wrong. So first degree um, intentional homicide was count one. Second count was the um, dismembering of the corpse. And the third count was that third degree sexual assault. So that is what the jury is having to decide today. Is she NGI for all of this or not? Right? Um, so when we talk about NGI, this is what happens. Once the defendant has entered a plea of NGI, and there's reason to believe that that exists, the defendant 
can have a physician or psychologist appointed by the court, not more than three, and they can examine the defendant and testify at trial. The, comp uh, the compensation of the physicians or psychologists is fixed by the court and paid by the county on the order of the court. So a lot of you asked how that was paid. That is statutory how that is paid. The fact that the physician or psychologist has been appointed by the court shall be made known to the jury and the physician or psychologist shall be subject to cross-examination by both parties. Um, not less than 10 days before trial, a physician or psychologist under subpoena must file their report. We know the reports are here. They need to discuss in it, and again, this is all laid out by statute, and let's see, I'm at, I'm at, if you're interested, we're at Wisconsin statute 971.16 that goes through the examination of the defendant. The defendant is not competent to refuse medical treatment if because of mental illness, developmental disability, alcoholism, or drug dependence, and after the advantages and disadvantages and alternatives to accepting the particular medication or treatment have been explained to the defendant, one of the following is true. The defendant is incapable of expressing an understanding of the advantage or disadvantages of accepting medical treatment, meaning can the court force medicate someone? The defendant is substantially incapable of applying an understanding of the advantages or disadvantages. So they, the court can medicate a defendant or not, but you have to weigh whether or not the uh, defendant shall be medicated. And the report from the expert needs to contain an opinion regarding the defendant's ability to appreciate the wrongfulness of their conduct or conform their conduct to the requirements of law at the time of the, com the commission of the charge of defense. And is uh, if sufficient information is available to the physician to reach an opinion about whether or not medication would help. So those are the factors buried in the statute that the defense has to prove, that the defendant was unable to appreciate the wrongfulness of their conduct or conform their conduct with the requirements of law. That is what they are doing. Hopefully that makes sense. The defense has to prove during this phase of trial that the defendant was unable to appreciate the wrongfulness of their conduct or conform their conduct to the law. Hopefully that makes sense. So with all of that, the defense standard is not beyond a reasonable doubt. The defense standard is closer to a uh, a preponderance standard. It is, uh, where did I have, where did I want to read it exactly? So I don't, so I don't misstate it for you by going, it's a whiff of a standard. It is a little bit more than that. It is in my notes and escaping me. Um, where is it? Greater weight of the evidence. The defendant can testify in this phase of the trial. So again, we're at like a 50-50, greater weight of the evidence, more, more true than not true. And the jury needs to decide by 5-6. This is not a unanimous jury, and this is not beyond a reasonable doubt. The defense is going to do their opening first, then the prosecution, then witnesses, maybe two or three, then closing then it will go to the jury. I think we will have a verdict on this today as well. I call this a um, I call this a penalty phase, a responsibility phase, but the penalty is what they're arguing over here. If she is found NGI, then she will go to a state mental health facility and receive treatment. It will likely still be a locked facility, but the ultimate, I think the ultimate goal for a defendant pleading NGI in a case like this is that there is the possibility to get out, not life without the possibility of parole. So with all of that, um, Gina said, I don't understand why she killed him. I don't know if anybody understands why she killed him. I don't know if she understands why she killed him. I think she understands that she killed him. I think she wanted to keep killing him, but I don't know if we know why. 
Alicia said, what was a motive ever discussed? Um, no, the facts are such that the defense don't, the defense doesn't need to, or the prosecution apologies. I've, my brain has already switched into NGI phase. The prosecution doesn't need to prove why they just need to prove that she did it. And in her interview with police, she knew she was killing him. And she said that she enjoyed doing that. And again, antisocial behavior does not count under NGI. Just because this behavior is far outside the bounds of acceptable behavior in society, far outside the conformity with law, doesn't mean that it's automatically NGI. She could the prosecution is going to argue she could perceive what she was doing was wrong. Hence, she attempted to clean it up and hide it. And that's, I think, where we are with this case. So I'm going to get to as many questions as, as we can. Um, and then we will, we've got about 20 minutes before the jury comes back. So let's, I'm going to just leave this on in court real quick. Is, I don't know. The, the, the bailiffs are like, are we almost done with this? I think we're almost done with this. Miku said she was still high when interviewed, though. The defense is arguing that. The prosecution's not arguing that. The prosecution is saying she was starting to get sleepy when interviewed, but they're going to let the jury decide that. Um, so we'll see. We need to hear what the experts say. I'm curious as to what the experts say. I'm curious to see the battle of the experts on this. And the experts, again, have to talk about this defendant. It's not generalities. It needs to be specifics about this specific and particular defendant. Um, so no death penalty in her state, correct? Or are they not seeking that? Love from the Netherlands. Thank you, Karina. Um, no death penalty in Wisconsin is my understanding. Have you ever seen a juror say no while being polled? Yes. It may not be coffee and cursey words, but there will be coffee and cursey words. I have seen it. Not one of my cases, but I have seen jurors be like, wait, no, that's not what I said. Um, I've also seen that be be in error, but I've also seen that be like, go back to the jury room and sort this out. I've also seen that lead to hung juries. It does happen where jurors are like, wait, what? No Dr. Spiegel testimony about street value. We have no Dr. Spiegel testimony today. Um, that's for sure. Lisa said, I had to put my wonderful 11-year-old Roddy to sleep yesterday. You put a smile on my face. Thank you. The Lawnards are here. We're here to just let you escape sometimes running away from your responsibilities. I have a sticker on my desk. I was trying to find somewhere to put it. Um, me today as well. I'm running away from my responsibility and it feels so good. Michael Scott, this, I'm not sure where I'm going to be putting it, but this is how I feel when it's like, I've run away to trial coverage. It's like, goodbye. <laughs> I'll be back at the end of the day. <laughs> We're just running away to talk to the law nerds about trial coverage. Question, why doesn't the defense attorney have a computer? It might be due to Taylor Shabusiness's behavior earlier on in the case. The way I would be pissed, the way I would be pissed if my, um, if my client acted in a way such that I could not have my computer. However, when I stopped doing trial work um, in 2017, I was not bringing a computer into court Either way, the defense attorney has a table full of binders with tabs. That is how I did things. Would that perhaps be different now? Maybe, but there is something easier for my brain to remember where things are in physical form than to try to search it up in the computer. So I did not practice with a computer on my desk either. Um, it just wasn't there yet. Of course, a lot has changed between 2017 and 2023, um, but it might be because of her behavior previous previously. She did lunge at her defense attorney. Um, so G, I hope we covered this. Um, uh, mental disease or defect is what it is under the law. Um, I'm not trying to relanguage things as they are in the law. I've said this in other laws where people take umbrage with the way that the law is worded or the way the law says things. Law can feel outdated and antiquated, but it also tries to be specific and there's a lot that goes into changing the languaging of something going from NGI to not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. You, you also have a, like a breadth of case law that defines what that is. So this is the legal standard. I don't know if the legal standard is going to change. Um, I think that's where we're at. So, um, crew kid 52. Hey, Emily just left a law firm. I was working at for a different job, but 
In only 2.5 months, I was able to develop amazing relationships with the attorney and gain great insight into the litigation process, even as a file clerk. That's fantastic. Congratulations on the new job. Um, how about guilty by reason of mental defect? That does not exist. Only not guilty. This is about responsibility. And the law wants to make sure that they are not punishing people that truly do not perceive that what they are doing is wrong. The law is meant to be like this. These things are the boundaries of our society. And when you step outside the boundaries of our society, there is a consequence to that. So um, if somebody can't perceive those rules and adhere to them, the law allows for some some room within that, not no responsibility, but different types of responsibility, meaning a treatment facility versus custody. Though, if she has diagnosed, uh, any diagnosed uh, medical issues, especially with mental, those should be dealt with well in custody. Though that goes state by state, because you hear, um, you hear people in custody with uh, blood pressure or, or diabetes issues not being able to get treatment. It's not easy to get medical treatment while in custody. That should be available. It's different in a locked mental health facility than in a locked prison um, population. The amount of help one would get is different. And I think all of you are like, this is behavior that needs some help. This is not behavior that we see every day. Um, do can people use NGI when it comes to DWI cases? How is this case able to use that defense when she used drugs and did the thing? DWI and DUI, so driving under the influence, again, is a voluntary intoxication issue. I have not seen anyone try to argue like addiction or alcoholism, and I, there is probably case law about it that argues whether or not you are not choosing to drink um but i don't think the law recognizes addiction as involuntary intoxication and if there's case law on that i would be very interested in finding it um because again involuntary intoxication is generally the case where you are drugged by someone else you have not willingly ingested the thing so involuntary intoxication generally does not account for addiction I don't know if the law has, if case law has changed on that, I would absolutely need to look. But the prosecution is going to argue exactly what you said, that she might be acting outside of the bounds of, of polite society, which I think is a mild way to say it, because of the use of methamphetamine. But that does not count for NGI, if that makes sense. Uh, let's continue on. Can the jury say she's NGI for one charge, but not the rest of it? it? has to be all. It has to be all, Alex, because if she can't perceive the wrongness of, if she can't perceive the wrongness of what she's doing, she can't perceive the wrongness of what she's doing. Can there be more experts if the defense pays for them or is three the limit? Uh, I don't think that's going to come up here. I don't know in, in Wisconsin if the court would allow it. The court can appoint up to three. Could the defense pay for more? Maybe. Do they need to? I don't know. Uh, Malstar said, question, do you think the defense will call any experts since they just said they won't call the pharmacologist? Yes, they have a psychologist uh, or psychiatrist. I'm not sure which, but they have another expert. So they were going to bring in two. Um, why isn't the death penalty on the table? Shanta, not available in Wisconsin. Also, different states choose to deal with, um, to deal with death penalty different. Some states not all murder cases are death penalty cases. So even in states that have the death penalty, it normally has to go a, above just a murder. Death penalty decisions aren't made like, well, you murdered somebody. So now that's on the table. It goes kind of above and beyond that. When you get to um, dismembering a corpse, a lot of people are going to look at that and be like, this is um, this is well outside. But is Taylor Shabizness? business? Um, well, it doesn't really matter in Wisconsin how the prosecutions would have made that made that determination. So, it it um, it, it really doesn't. But multiple victims tend to tend to increase the chances of a death penalty depending on the state. Um, torture while people are alive, particularly vulnerable victims, those tend to be some of the considerations. 
Um, Elisa said psychologist as she has a PhD. Thank you for that. They were talking about that right before that this is a PhD, uh, not an MD. So let's see. Uh, question, why didn't they call the pharmacologist? They withdrew calling the pharmacologist. And at the end of the day yesterday, the court raised some very valid concerns saying, hey, I don't think this witness can tie the things they can testify to within their expertise to this defendant. Like it's outside the bounds of um, that person's expertise because they can't diagnose. The the pharmacist can't diagnose this defendant. So giving broad generalities of these things, these things do happen is not going to work for an NGI. Question, she was charged with dismemberment with intention to conceal a crime. Is there a charge without intention to conceal? Um, that's almost more terrifying. Katie, if you listen to the jury instructions, the, the dismemberment in here, hold on. I can answer this with, I need the complaint. Let me go get the complaint. There are in this, well, in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, the law gives you options. So it's like dismemberment with this, 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 this. And this one is the same way. Uh, there are, it could be this, it could be that, it could be this. They chose dismemberment with intent to conceal because that's what they thought best fit the facts and the evidence in this case. I'm going to see if the ors are in the, um, if the ors are in the complaint because they're in the jury instruction. So let's see, the complaint simply says oh so that's what they've been doing at the beginning um did dismember a corpse with intent to conceal a crime contrary to 940.11 well let's go look at 940.11 real quick because the jury instruction gave options um to this and since we have time we're going to answer the question we're going to answer the question because i don't remember what the three were um and now we know under Wisconsin 940.111, mutilates, disfigures, or dismembers a corpse with intent to conceal a crime, avoid apprehension, or prosecution. So what are they trying to do? And in the jury instructions, you will get these things in brackets, and it's like this or this or this, and you're trying to figure out what it is. So conceal a crime is what they did. Avoid apprehension, I don't know, the fact scenario would have to be different, but no. It's all in varieties of not getting caught. Elizabeth said, hey, DB on the road to West Palm to see Dave. Have the best Dave weekend. West Palm is a venue I want to go to, though I did almost explode um, with how hot it was in Georgia. So I don't know if I can handle West Palm, um, but the set list are probably gonna be great. I did not get a drunken soldier this tour and I am sad, but I did see the first time Dave performed honky tonk woman and and just a just a sidebar the second that fucking cowbell came out i looked at my husband i went that's honky tonk woman and the people around me were like dave doesn't play honky tonk woman i'm like that is honky tonk woman and then he started playing honky tonk woman i was like put the respect the respect the respect because i called that from the first the very first Clanks of that cowbell. I was like, that's Honky Tonk Woman. That's exactly what that is. I don't always, I can't always call a song within the first like 10 seconds, but when I can, I'm very excited about it. Often I can, but I've been to a lot of shows. Sarah asked, what if psychosis is a consequence of the voluntary intoxication? Then that is a voluntary intoxication and that does not count for an NGI defense. So you cannot willfully become intoxicated and then blame that willful intoxication which is why drugs are terrifying um we heart entertainment said like chad doberman in ohio that's a death penalty case and different again different prosecutorial agencies decide death penalty different depending on their jurisdiction and their office why isn't this a murder case why homicide it depends on the state law so different states call their crimes different things and Wisconsin calls it homicide. Some places call it murder, but same, same. It's either way, it's the death at the hands of another. So it just depends on how the state legislature writes the laws. 
I used to live in Eastman Avenue and Green Bay, so kind of freaked out. Wisconsin is not a DP state. Yes. And that we've talked about it not being um, a death penalty state. Anna Banana said, Emily, where is her new baby? I have, when did Taylor Business have a baby? I have no idea. And I have no idea. So it would be my presumption that if she has a child, that child would be with family, um, with her family in in some way so let's see uh murder is a fairly prejudicial word i i mean homicide is too but at some point do a pickle fl- cleanse this today is going to be an interesting um an interesting case her baby is too then probably with family would be my assumption and they are they generally try to do that um without having to put children into the foster system so question if ngi is proven would she go to prison or a secure hospital the she would go to i think what the statute says exactly is a appropriate facility so it depends on a facility with the level with the level of care to meet the level of need um i will say that state psychiatric facilities are not necessarily a a far better option than custody is not an easy circumstance but it might be the best level of care for someone, but it also has that opportunity of getting out, which, which, you know, life without parole does not give you that option. I think this is the option that she wants. I don't know if this is the option she's going to get. This jury's gonna have to decide today. Sorry, we needed, it, it was time for hand lotion. I, yeah, I had seen word that she had a kid and was potentially married. I have not really looked into her all that much other than the facts of this case the statements that were made and really the facts of the case um that is that is what i was most interested in i didn't really go digging into it that might come up at sentencing um well if they come back ngi there's not really much to do at sentencing i think they would still allow victim impact statements but there's not much to do it would just be sentenced to a mental health facility instead of sentenced to um prison so let's see questions we have about five more minutes before court comes back emily you're keeping me company while i lesson plan shout out to all the pawnards hello pawnards and also i'm here all day well or at least until this is done i think i don't think this is going to take all day i think we're going to see 10 minutes of an opening statement from each side maybe we're going to see two or three witnesses and then a closing from each side that'll probably be about 15 minutes each and then we're done and then it'll go to the jury and then we'll have a verdict and that's it Question of experts refuse to take the stand in the past. What happens if prosecutors and or defense can't find an expert? If you can't find an expert, that is a big problem. You generally can always find a state expert and there is a list of state experts. The biggest problem is finding an expert for the defense that is going to confirm what you suspect. Because again, the lawyer is like, well, you're telling me that this is the case and um, this behavior warrants a, a conversation about whether this is the case. And we saw that in the interview, right? The police were asking her, like, did you know you were killing him? Did you know this was wrong? The police were asking questions, anticipating this based on the fact that this is a dismemberment case. In every police interview of every, you know, murder out there, if somebody shoots somebody in the course of a robbery, they're generally not asking, did you know that this was wrong? The police aren't worried about it in the same way. Here, with a a horribly um, violent dismemberment, the police are like, but ma'am did you know that what you were doing was wrong um they could foresee that this that this might be the way that this would go um at trial and ask the right questions and it's probably a good thing that they did um moo boy moo good to see you said question can you cover the billy mitchell versus twin galaxies lawsuit it's going to be in october uh will be about video game world records and defamation I will take a look. I had not heard of it, but I will take a look. I will always take a look. I will always take a look. Is she physically restrained? Yesterday she had on a shock device, which goes around the chest um, and her ankles were restrained. I imagine that's the same today. So we'll see. Um, What else? I saw a question from Lisa. I haven't followed this. I thought she was found guilty yesterday. 
Lisa H., she was found guilty yesterday. Today is trial part two because she has also pled not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, and the same jury has to decide this. So we are essentially in a penalty phase of the trial to decide where she will go um, for her sentencing. Just curious why she didn't go with postpartum defense. I believe her baby was just born around the time of the murder. I don't know how the law recognizes postpartum with regard to mental disease or defect. I would have to see case law on it, though a lot of people suffer from postpartum and don't go over to their high school friend's house and strangle them. So I don't know if the facts also fit. On another topic, love the new hair color. It's not new. This is the old hair color. It's just um, not been, re <laughs> been refreshed. So thank you, child with the grandparents. Um, that's what I expected. Cheryl again asked, has she been found guilty? Yes, she was convicted yesterday. Um, and we will keep doing kind of short bits of what's going on in this case as we go through it. But here's what we are looking for today. Let's see if I can do this more succinctly than I have done it in the past. We're going to start speed running this and see if I get better at it. Here's what we're at today. Defendant was found guilty yesterday. Defendant has pled NGI. The jury, the same jury as yesterday, has to determine if this defendant, though they did the act, is not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. The jury has to determine determine that by a five sixth vote. It's the same 12 that convicted her yesterday. The defense has the burden of proof here. Greater weight of the credible evidence, a lower standard substantially than beyond a reasonable doubt. This is the greater weight of the credible evidence and they need to determine whether or not this defendant was um, capable of perceiving that what they were doing was wrong at the time or whether or not they were capable of actually conforming to the laws of society. That's what essentially the jury is going to have to determine. Did this defendant know that they were committing a crime and could they conform behavior with the law? Could they have not done this? That is the question. You haven't heard of Billy Mitchell. You're in for a treat when you research the wackiness. Well, we love a case that is not as heavy as this one. So um, NGI. NGI stands for not guilty by reason of insanity. The law languaging has been updated, but I am also old and I'm an old attorney. And NGI is always the way it has been referred to. And NGMD or D is way too hard to say. So I go up, I go with um, NGI, meaning not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, because NGI is way easier to say. Yellow Pill said, look up cases for postpartum psychosis. There have been cases of women harming their children. I have seen case law on that fact scenario. I have not seen case law on the scenario where it is an unrelated third party. Um, that unrelated third party being like, the high school friend who she hooked up with sometimes that this this case this fact scenario i have never seen uh did he live in the basement was it his room or was it more like a storage room the basement had mattresses and stuff in it it seemed that the victim stayed at his mom's house in the basement sometimes and again this is a furnished basement that seemed like it had it had a shower down there and stuff so it seemed like it could be used as a room but maybe it was not permanently used as a room that's kind of what I took away from the testimony. Defense counsel referred to it as the NGI phase, so he's old school too. I mean, it again, it is the it is the common language to refer to this defense, and NGI is much easier to say than the rest of it. Um, Emily, hearing you say NGI triggers my nurse brain, and I hear NG tube. That's fair. Th these things mean different things in the world. Question, would it still count as voluntary intoxication if they argued that it was meth exasperating an existing underlying mental health issue she already had? This is a great question. This came up a little bit yesterday when they were talking about what the pharmacologist would discuss. I want to see how the experts discuss this. They're, the authority in the case law that I have looked at does not point to voluntary intoxication triggering or exasperating an underlying condition 
as anything other than voluntary intoxication. Like you chose, you chose to do the thing and then an unexpected result happened, but the voluntary intoxication is still there. So I have not seen that successfully used. And I don't think that you can um, use that in that way because it is still voluntary intoxication. Where you have drug use or habitual drug use interacting with brain damage, like literally actual underlying brain damage is when you have habitual drug use that has caused that damage and that damage exists whether or not you are intoxicated or under the influence. And I don't think that is the case here, but I'm interested to see. The jury is present. That's a timely jury. I'm interested to see what the experts say. And that's what we're going to do now. Uh, briefly, that's okay. Sorry. James, what do you need? So I told counsel, um, it doesn't seem like there's an issue, but I just wanted to make a record of incidental contact that I had with the juror. I was. Incidental contact with a juror. I've had incidental contact with a juror. Remind me to tell the story at the break. It was deeply uncomfortable, but this is exactly what you have to do, which is disclose it to the court immediately. Entering the restroom, he was exiting the restroom, and uh, there were reflexive morning comments. Uh, I then realized he was a juror. This is not an um, issue. There wasn't any further contact. Uh, that was about 8.40 a.m., so I was admittedly a little surprised to see a juror here this early, but I just wanted to make a record of that. It's not going to be an issue. That's the right thing to do. Your Honor, Mr. Uh, Saunders told me about this. I don't believe it's really an issue at all. These types of things periodically happen, and usually it's so it is innocuous, but you still have to tell the court. To the jurors not to talk to the attorneys, uh, the attorneys um, and the parties not to talk to the jurors. Um, if you see somebody, you feel like you're compelled to say hi. In this case, Mr. Saunders seems like wasn't even aware that it was a juror. He was not even expecting to see a juror. Sometimes he had his head down and was heading to the bathroom. Study their faces so you know what you're dealing with. I'm satisfied given what he's represented. This is not an issue. You know, than what occurred, and um, the exchange was, was innocuous and really was the case. But I appreciate you letting me know, Mr. Saunders. Anything else before the jury? No, thank you. Mr. Fraley? No, Your Honor, thank you so much. My issue was much more of an issue. He said it. I was talking. The judge said, bring the jury. It's time to bring the jury, y'all. Let's bring the jury time. Good morning. A good day for trial. Nope. My juror encounter was not by my choice or my error, and that juror got dismissed rapidly. Kristen's canine said, I am bad with faces. I'd be screwed. You wouldn't. You just talk to no one in the courthouse and normally jurors wear little identifications. It's hard when you go to lunch and you don't know if they're sitting Ladies around and you. Gentlemen, welcome back. I hope you had a good evening. That's why in trial you eat lunch at your desk. This is the second phase of the trial. Um, and I'm going to give you uh, these instructions. The uh, defendant has been found guilty of first degree intentional homicide. By you. Corpse By y'all yesterday. You did that yesterday. Assault. We will now proceed with the second phase of this trial. During the second phase, you will be asked to determine whether the defendant is not responsible by reason of mental disease or defect. Before you may find the defendant is not responsible for the criminal conduct, the defendant must satisfy you to a reasonable certainty by the greater weight of the credible evidence that at the time the crime was committed, the defendant had a mental disease or defect and as a result, lacked substantial capacity either to appreciate the wrongfulness of the conduct or to conform that conduct to the requirements of the law. It's like what we law. said. See, the jury instructions just mimic this the law. This issue will be, will be presented to you in the form of two questions. First, at the time the crime was committed, did the defendant have a mental disease or defect? Second, as a result of the mental disease or defect, did the defendant lack substantial capacity either to appreciate the wrongfulness of the conduct or to conform that conduct to the requirements of the law. 
You will be asked to answer the second question only if you answer the first question, yes. If you find the defendant is not responsible for the criminal conduct, the defendant will be committed to the custody of the Department of Health and S Department of Health Services and will be placed in an appropriate institution unless the court determines that the defendant would not pose a danger to herself or to others if released under conditions or what? By the Wait, the you only you tell them what the punishment is, Your Honor. You your your jury instructions tell them what the punishment is. That's fascinating to me. We're going to back up just a little bit because they are telling the jury, if you find her NGI, this is what's going to happen. I, that's fascinating to me. Okay, Wisconsin. Will be presented to you in the form of two questions. First, at the time the crime was committed, did the defendant have a mental disease or defect? Second, as a result of the mental disease or defect, did the defendant lack substantial capacity either to appreciate the wrongfulness of the conduct or to conform that conduct to the requirements of the law? They could say, yes, at the time of the crime, this defendant was suffering a mental disease or defect. They could then say, no, that mental disease or defect does not mean that she can't appreciate the wrongfulness of her crime or conduct her behavior to the requirements of the law. You will be asked to answer the second question only if you answer the first question, yes. If you find the defendant is not responsible for the criminal conduct, the defendant will be committed to the custody of the Department of Health and S Department of Health Services and will be placed in an appropriate institution unless the court determines that the defendant would not pose a danger to herself or to others if released under happen. conditions ordered by the court. The only issue at this second phase of the trial is the defendant's mental condition at the time of the offense. The lawyers will now make opening statements. Interesting. The purpose of an opening statement is to give the lawyers an opportunity to tell you what I... they expect the evidence will show so that you will better understand the evidence as it is introduced during the trial. I must caution you, however, that the opening statements are not evidence. And ladies and gentlemen, because this phase of the trial, the burden of proof shifts to the defense, the, the order of questioning and presentation will change, and Mr. Freilich will go first. And he's going to have to ask non-leading questions. Yes, I am, there are. Very good. Go ahead. Thank you. If NGI, she can't be punished under the law, but she will be in a locked facility so that she is safe, so that others Your are Honor, safe. Your Honor, may I please the court? Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the jury, good morning. Mr. Lassay, Mr. Saunders, y'all of the jury, of the state of Wisconsin. You're going to hear some testimony. We are in, in this a whole case second trial. The defense expert, uh, Dr. Diane Litton. She's from the uh, Menasha area. Uh, she's a PhD. She's a forensic psychologist. You're going to hear testimony from um, the state uh, doctors as well, Dr. Matthew Seipel and Dr. I want Dr. Curry. Christina counsel, Engine. counsel. Um, can we have Dr. Curry, The burden please? does shift to the defense in this particular we case. We're Dr. in phase Curry. two now. And the burden shifts to the defense to me uh, to ask you to consider whether the defendant, uh, Taylor Denise Shabizas, is responsible or is not responsible by reason of mental disease or defect. And Wisconsin law, under Wisconsin statutes 971.15, does require the defense to satisfy you jurors um, to a reasonable certainty by the greater weight of the credible evidence that at the time the crimes were committed, which was February 22nd of 2022, right that Taylor Shabizas had a mental disease or had a mental defect and that as a result, she lacked the substantial capacity either to appreciate the wrongfulness of her conduct or to conform her conduct to the requirements of the law. So that's packed, that's packed with a lot of information <clears throat> that you're gonna have to consider. I did tell you yesterday that you're kind of like analysts. You're gonna have to listen to the testimony, listen to the facts, assess the credibility 
of witnesses assess the information that you're receiving, and then you'll have to make some decisions and considerations on these important legal issues. Um, the defense did retain Dr. Diane Litton. Uh, she interviewed Taylor Shabizas. We believe that the evidence will show that she did a thorough evaluation of Ms. Shabizas' mental status, that you will hear about Dr. Litton's uh, extensive experience in the field of psychology. Um, when you have experts, you kind of heard from other experts, and they have a, a resume or a CV. Uh, in the field, we say CV, curriculum vitae. It's a, okay. a list of their uh, experience and training and education. And you're going to hear that uh, Dr. Litton has been a uh, psychiatrist, or, excuse me, psychologist since 1993 that she has extensive experience, that she has approximately uh, 3,000 hours of post-doctoral training, that she conducted hundreds of uh, forensic evaluations, NGI competency evaluations, th things of that sort. You will hear testimony that uh, she worked at Mendota Mental Health Institution here in Wisconsin, uh, that she looked at many different evaluations uh, performed on Taylor Shvizis, including from Dr. Tracy Lucetta, Dr. Matthew Seipel, Dr. Christina Engine, Dr. D uh, Dr. Deborah Collins. This defendant has had a lot of evaluations. And, uh, you will hear that Dr. Litton, uh, we believe she'll testify that she looked at a whole uh, myriad of records, including jail records, Bell and Health, mental health records, a court order, an order for civil commitment, mental health uh, order, an order to take psychotropic medications, basically a medication order. She These will, are the orders believe, from the court testify after. that she reviewed uh, Nicolay Psychiatric Center mental health records from Brown after County. the murder. She will talk uh, and testify about her contacts with Ms. Shabizas uh, on the different occasions that she met with her. One being a situation where a chair was thrown by my client at her before I got involved in the case. She threw she a chair at the doctor? She did have a um, another interview with her at the jail and she asked me to sit in. Um, I would imagine after getting a chair thrown at her, the doctor absolutely wanted to have her sit in or have the attorney sit in. This is this is also the defendant who attacked her defense attorney. But again, um, well, we'll see. We'll we'll see. we'll see what happens. But throwing a chair at the doctor is definitely not going to endear the doctor towards you. So you're going to hear about all of her findings, her observations, and her opinions in this particular case. We believe that she has extensive experience. She's been in this field for a very long time and that you need to pay close attention to what she says and give her opinions um, strong consideration. Give it due weight. And we'll believe, we believe that her testimony will be that she's of the opinion that Taylor Shabizas does qualify for the NGI plea based on her diagnosis of a serious mental disorder. And that she has some other opinions and she'll tell I you I don't about know if Taylor Shabizas agrees with when you. she testifies. Are her shenanigans hear, intentional? I think that's what the prosecution experts going to say. I believe testimony from my client's father, Arturo Coronado. And I believe that he will come here. He's been summoned by the defense by subpoena to answer some questions about his daughter growing up, how she was. Her dad kind of issues, will be testifying. Problems did she have, what kind of mental health issues, and what he did to try and help her get uh, treatment. She also has the right to testify. You will hear from Dr. Litton about my client's <clears throat> mother, uh, that she lost her mother at a young age and that that was a pivotal event in her life. Dr. Litton will also provide some testimony about the fact that she believes there may have been a budding personality disorder 
and that she saw a, a really disturbed teen when she assessed all of the school records. She looked at all the school records and did a table or a chart. She looked at the mental health history. Did she did a one page chart on that? Um, you know, the the burden of proof in this case does rest with the defense on the NGI issue. I think that the testimony from all of these different professionals going different to the doctors, defendant's name, her maiden name was Coronado. That's her dad's name, which you just heard him behavior, talking about and things of that sort. You can hear their testimony about all of the different problems, all of the different mental health issues, all of the different behavioral issues that Taylor Chavez has had growing up as a, as a kid, as a youth. She had a lot of obstacles that she had to face growing up. Uh, we believe Dr. Litton will also provide some testimony about my client's prior treatment with antipsychotic medications. She will testify about my client going off these antipsychotic medications sometime after her inpatient treatment in 2021. And Dr. Litton will set up and provide the background history and information on Taylor Shabizis's life and upbringing. So the defense does have the burden of proof on this issue of whether our client is responsible for these crimes. But we believe that the testimony and the evidence will show that at the time of the offense that she did have a mental disease or defect. We believe that the information and the testimony will show and hopefully lead to you to conclude that she lacked the substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of her conduct or to conform her conduct to the requirements of the law. And those are the and what I ask is that you just sit back carefully listen to what these experts have to say and uh, and then render a, a fair and just result. Thank you. And y'all, I know a lot of you disagree with what the defense is arguing. Here's what I would ask you to keep in mind. Go ahead. Good morning. This is the defense's job. In most of the trials that we watch, you're going to disagree with the arguments made by some of the attorneys. If you're on the jury, you get to disagree. Y'all get to disagree anyway. This attorney is not casting judgment on the world as a whole, they are trying to say for this defendant, all of these things mean that that she is NGI. That is their job. Even if you disagree, even if the weight of evidence in the world disagrees, that is their job. So I get that you don't, I see it chat. I agree with you. I'm with you. The defense is doing their job. And you can see him being like, I'm doing my job. Y'all, here I am. These are our experts. But are we going to get from a diagnosed personality disorder to mental disease or defect under the law? I, it's going to take a lot. So when I said an opening on uh, Monday, uh, that he has a much more natural style and responsibility. This is what we're referring to, right? The responsibility phase is, is what we're here for now. Um, essentially, you're being asked, you know, what was the defendant's mental state? at the time of the offenses for which she's convicted and whether she should be responsible. I've sped this up a little because we got a little behind because um, I keep pausing. Let's address the obvious. Uh, what Mr. Business did to Shad is disturbing. It's conduct we don't see often. It's completely it's fucked, counsel. Think, My gosh, that person must not have been in their right mind when that happened. I'm is the prosecutor speaking? Chad, is the prosecutor speaking to you? Is the prosecutor speaking to you? This is, this is the prosecutor speaking to this jury saying, you look at these crimes and go, that's not behavior within the bounds of civilized society. And then he's like, I get it. I get it. I'm not going to sit here and try to convince you otherwise. But you've already carefully listened to the evidence and followed the law that the judge gave you. And you'll do so going forward as well. Because you will be told what a mental disease or defect is and what it is not. A mental disease is not antisocial conduct. It's not conduct brought about by use of a controlled substance, a temporary mental state caused by a controlled substance. A person is not mentally ill just because they commit something that's unnatural, that's so enormous, that just is beyond comprehension. Oh, unnatural right? is a great use of language. You'll be instructed those are not mental all. diseases or defects. So as disturbing as the conduct that. you I'm already heard about that. is and maybe that's not where the analysis ends. It's a great You'll way to break it down, counsel. From several experts. 
defense already went over Dr. Litton and her uh, qualifications, and how she supports Michigan Business's NGI plea. But you also hear some, some issues with Dr. Litton's methodology, her analysis, and ultimately her conclusions. The state will call several uh, psychologists of its own, both of whom were actually court appointed, not by either party, by the court, when they did their uh, analysis and meetings with Misha Business. Dr. Matthew Seipel will talk about some of the issues with, that he had with Dr. Litton's methodology and her conclusions. He'll testify about those. So we might get four witnesses. You'll also hear from the court appointed expert, Dr. Christina Engman. Again, uh, came here on a court order, not retained by either side. Uh, and she'll tell you that she does not believe Misha Business is suffering from a mental disease or defect, or that she was unable or lacked substantial capacity to conform her conducts, uh, conduct to the requirements of law or appreciate the wrongfulness of her conduct. Okay. So you'll hear from a variety of witnesses, some of whom are experts, some of whom are lay witnesses or, you know, civilians. Her father. You'll hear about, and you've already heard about, confounding all of this is the defendant's drug use immediately before the offense. We've all heard about that. The defendant's admitting that and acknowledging that. This is not you'll a secret. You'll hear about how methamphetamine has those effects, has effects of psychosis, that has that result in people. And again, it's not a mental disease or defect if you're using controlled substances, and it causes that result. I'm waiting for that to happen, too. So you'll hear from these experts and, and, and witnesses, but ultimately, in our state, whether somebody is uh, suffering from a mental disease or defect is a jury determination. It's up to you, based on the facts and opinions that you hear. Certainly, the opinions of the uh, experts will be valuable for you. But you've already heard all the evidence. You know more about this case than any of these experts likely do. You heard testimony you about get to decide. Mr. Business's mental state both before and after, in close proximity to the offenses that she's convicted of. You've heard her friends, her roommate, officers who had contact with her, Mr. Hendricks, Ms. Pakinich, describe their interactions in close proximity to this offense and reported nothing out of the ordinary, some of whom are her friends, who've known her for quite a while. Mr. Gannon, Mr. Tomes, you've already heard about their observations of the defendant. But more importantly, you saw the defendant's own words. Yep. Hours after all of these offenses occurred, really close proximity, you saw her be able to recall, be able to talk about it, and more importantly, you saw her mannerisms. You saw How her try to hide it. Did not appear anyone was suffering under some manic episode. She's calmly talking about it with officers, providing information that is consistent with everything they're seeing. What does that indicate? She's aware of what's going on. She remembers everything. This isn't somebody who is not appreciating what happened. So that's why we call all these experts, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's a jury determination. It's a factual issue for you. Not and the state all, believes man. that that's why you hear all that right. evidence and consider the evidence Keep you heard in the first phase, that you'll find the defendant has failed to meet her burden, that she should be held responsible for the conduct that she's convicted of and what she did to Shad. Thank you. Oh, he took the mic with him. Thanks, counsel. Hey, okay, Mr. Friend, are you prepared to call your first witness? Um, I need to confer with the uh, lieutenant. Call your first witness, sir. We knew this was happening. My witness is on his way up, Your Honor. Okay. We knew Thank what you. was we knew what was happening. We're going to do a few questions while they're waiting for the the first witness to come up. This is probably going to be done today. Uh, look up the case law. Oh, we talked about that. Absolutely, slightly different circumstance here. Well, largely different circumstance here. Um. Lori said, is it sad that I changed my day to leave for the beach and hang with EDB, the Law Nerds and Paw Nerds? Also, uh, DM Winery is a short trip from here. Just saying, Dave Matthews Winery in Virginia, I believe. She was infatuated with Jeffrey Dahmer. They talked about those searches yesterday. Her hubs is in jail and it makes and makes a wild Facebook post and is standing by her. Your business isn't a real name. He changed it to that. I don't know how he's Facebook posting from jail. Did someone tell you that you were an incredible woman? We're going to tell that story later. We're going to we're going to tell that story later. Um, good day, mate, all the way from Melbourne, Australia. Love your channel and all you do. Thank you. As a professional, how do you read the defendant's behavior? I don't think the defendant particularly wants to be in court and have everybody talking about her. Um, for Doherty said, I just got accepted into a forensic psych master's program. I've been a psych nerd for life, but Dr. Curry was my inspo for going back to school. Don't forget to tell Dr. Curry that too. 
um, because it's always good to hear that you've helped someone and encourage them to keep going. I don't know who she's smiling at. We'll see. Do experts always believe in the defense and stand by their assessment? Or do you think some just do it to help the process move along and prevent overturn on appeal? Oh no, they have to stand by their professional integrity. If an expert does not agree with the argument, they generally will say they don't agree with the argument. And the defense experts don't always agree with the defense argument. You'll never see that in court because then it will get yeeted before it comes to court. But no, experts don't always agree with their assessment of the case. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So it really just depends. Uh, it's important to remember the difference between how something makes you feel and how something makes you feel. I, I'm sure I read that with the emphasis in the wrong spot. EDB yesterday defense said, this is effed up, but for real, I thought of you. <laughs> it So yesterday when the defense was talking about this is effed up, it was about the defendant's interview. In the interview when law enforcement asked uh, Shabiznis like, hey, or told her, hey, we found a severed head at this um, address where you had just been. She said, yeah, that's pretty fucked up. And so the defense attorney was downplaying that in the questions a little bit and then let the F-bombs fly in court, which is always appropriate. Uh, Lee asked, when a lawyer loses a case, how do they get paid? The same way they get paid if they don't lose a case, particularly if they are a public servant. Wait, who, who is coming out in custody? I am. I thought the doctor was the one coming up. Arturo Coronado. Okay. Is this her father? If you stay standing, you turn and face her, and as best you can, uh, raise your right hand. Her dad's in custody too. Nothing but the truth in the matter. Now before the court, so help you back. Please have a seat and your name. Oh, they're calling her dad first. Arturo Coronado. Okay, Mr. Fairley, the witness is yours. Thank you, Mr. Coronado. Good morning. Good morning, sir. How old are you? Fifty-one. What is your date of birth? Five twenty-four seventy-two. Hey, May baby. Are you currently married, sir? I am not. Okay. Um, How do you know you the defendant? Green Bay, correct? Yeah, you know that, Chris. Okay. And uh, your daughter is Taylor Denise Shoe Business. Is that fair? She is. <clears throat> um, who is her mother? Marla. Okay. And you I were have married to Marla for so a while, sir? many questions. Of course. How many? How many years was it? We were together. We were married about ten. Together about fifteen, sixteen. I thought the doctor was coming up. I was. Did you live together in Wisconsin or some other Illinois, state? Illinois, 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 and Wisconsin. I was surprised. And where I'm was your surprised. daughter Taylor Shavizis born? In Evanston, Illinois. Okay. Does Taylor um, have a sister or brother? She has a brother that passed away last year. Okay. What was his name? AJ Arturo uh, Arturo Drep. They're going to talk about and her why did he growing up. What happened? July first, last year, motorcycle accident. I missed two passes. When you were living year. in Illinois uh, with your daughter, Taylor Shabizas, was she ever brought to a, a hospital at all? No. Okay. Did she ever receive any mental health treatment when you lived in Illinois? No. Okay. Um, did something happen to Taylor's uh, mother at some point? I'm not going to speculate away. on why her dad she is in custody. 20th, 2009. It will probably come up in cross examination. Okay. Did that take so. a toll on your daughter, Taylor? Well, of course. Yeah. Please don't uh, speculate tell me a little on bit, that. On my, on my son as well. And, and her me. brother passed okay. last year. Good Took a toll God. on everybody, correct? But yeah, That's yeah. a lot. And uh, when her mother passed away in, in May of 2009, how old was Taylor? Uh, 11, probably 11 and a half. Okay. My and son and daughter were yeah, about 9 and a half, 11 and a half years old. Okay. Um, did Taylor go to school that day that her mother passed away? I tried to get him to go to school, but they knew something was going on. Okay. They came back. Um, can you describe a little bit how the um, how the death of Taylor's mother took a toll on her or impacted her? Can you give me a little bit of commentary on that? Well, they were they were pretty young. I mean, obviously, you know, her mom's not around anymore, and you know, Marla was she was ill, so just I guess they kind of they kind of knew losing a parent is on, very but, hard. Uh, it was, again, it was unexpected. We I don't think that's going to be the night a before defense and, to your um, crime. Fell asleep and I woke up and my wife was. Uh, Already cold, okay. already passed. You you found her? She's laying next to me. Okay. And what about the kids? What about Taylor? Did she see your mom in that state? They did not see. No, I did not allow that. Okay. But were the kids in the house? They were upstairs in their bedrooms. Okay. Um, after that occurred, did uh, you see any um, changes in Taylor's uh, behavior, first of all? She's a little rambunctious. Nothing. 
I mean, she, she played volleyball. She had a, a good amount of friends she hung out with. She was a, a normal kid. Did things That's change? That's exactly what the defense said was going to happen. I wouldn't say too much. She got in trouble a little bit at school, but in opening, I don't know something with a band instrument. Um, what happened with that? Yeah, I have questions. No, she just took somebody's band instrument and then returned it. But and little, nothing, nothing major. Okay. Um, which when did you come to Green Bay? Excuse me, year? council. No, which instrument? I started working here in two thousand seven. Council. I need to know if she was running around with at? a tuba. Council. Uh, I worked for Verizon. Okay. I have questions. Before yeah, it was GTE, then turned into Verizon. Okay. Um, 18 years. Right. And uh, when you came to Green Bay, did um, Taylor go to school here then? Of course. Of course. Where did she go to school? Uh, she went through uh, the Howard Sonico School District. Sorry. Susa, did she go to Bayport Susa, High School as well? Susa phone. Yes, sir. Did you get information that um, she was having issues at school? Well. Council, her father said she had a lot of friends. She played volleyball. She was a little rambunctious, which I think is how most teens would be described. You're not, you're not going to get where you need to get, counsel. You're trying, but you're not going to get where you need to get on that. She took somebody's instrument that one time. Okay, okay, look, sir, that is that is not that is not antisocial behavior. Yeah. What can you tell me? Uh, from what I can recall, just normal. He said normal quite a lot. She was a teenager. She acted like just a teenager. Acting out, I guess. Just she was a teenager. A couple of in instances that happened in, in high school, but it's uh, kind of why I yanked her out of there and, and uh, sent, her, sent her to Texas so she graduated and kind of get away from the issues that were going on here. Uh, she went to Texas to live with her grandparents? Correct. When was that, do you know? Did her leaving to Texas 17, coincide with you going into custody? Because sure. I have questions about okay. that too. How old was she in, in that? In 2017, do you know? She was seven, 16, 16 and a half, like 17. 16, 17. How long did she live with her grandparents then in Texas? He would not have uh, been given year, that option. A little over a year until she graduated. No. Maybe two years. About, uh, what, a, about a year, maybe a year and a half. Was that Catula, Texas? That's correct. Um, was there a point where she got Absolute pregnant? Instruments are expensive. Mm, well, about a year and a half ago, maybe. Okay. What? And, yeah. and she had a baby, correct? Yes, she did. And the baby is currently. They want the jury to know that she is a mother. That is why this line of questioning, I know y'all are going to ask. I guess we're going to find out where her baby is living. Living in Texas with the grandparents, correct? Yeah. How is that relevant to anything here? Why, why do we need to talk about him? <laughs> her dad's like, sir, I know how the fuck this works. Why are we talking about my grandson? Ooh, dad is coming in hot today. I, I, I'm going to back that up and let you all see that exchange. In real time, apologies. Maybe two years. Uh, about, a, about a year, maybe a year and a half. Was that Catula, Texas? That's correct. Um, was there a point where she got pregnant? He's like, not in mm, high school. Well, about a year and a half ago, maybe. Okay. And, yeah. and she had a baby, correct? Yes, she did. And the baby is currently living in Texas with the grandparents, correct? Yeah. How is that relevant to anything here? Why, why do we need to talk about him? Let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. He wants to so, try to know she's a mother. Before sir. the baby was born, was she um, placed at Nicolay Psychiatric Center? Before the baby was born? Yeah. Possibly. Okay. Did you see her at the uh, Nicolay Psychiatric Center? Oh, she was yeah, there? yeah. I'm sorry. It's just so it's much going on. It's um, through Brown County. Yeah, I, I went to uh, take her there myself, actually. Okay. Why did you and take her there? She just wasn't in the right state of mind. Was she suicidal? I Probably. Was she psychotic? I Projection, I don't think this witness has the ability to answer that question. Rephrase the question. Okay. Was she um, experiencing How was she acting? She was, yeah, she wasn't. She was not in the right state of mind at all. So I feared that she would hurt herself. So that's why I took her. We both agreed. We both went there together and, and tried to get help. And um, and then ended up, ended up uh, uh, releasing her and she came home and that was about it. Okay. Was she prescribed some medications and things like that? She was at, at uh, that evening, no, but yeah, she has been on uh, some medications that she didn't, she never liked taking those pills. I mean, they kind of messed her up even worse. They call the reason that they are having the dad testify to this is because they don't want this to come in through Taylor Shabiznis's own testimony because her testifying is also an option here. They are trying to use the dad to kind of lay the foundation 
for past behavior. This is the defense case in chief. Cause her to hallucinate or cause her to have I think it all, started, it all started with a Seroquel that was taken, you know, back, you know, I, I don't understand too much about the, those uh, prescription drugs, but they never agreed with her at all. Okay. And do you know the other medications that she was asked to take? Uh, ADHD, uh, Adderall, I believe. Anything about Hel Haldol? I don't know. Okay. I know she was prescribed some stuff, but I don't know the names. Okay. Did you talk to some of the uh, doctors or psychiatrists at the Nicolay Psychiatric Facility? I, I'm going to object. I think this witness can offer his observations and the facts that he's aware of from what he observed in Ms. Shabusiness with respect to what he learned from doctors about her mental health conditions. We have professionals who are going to answer questions based on the, on the records. Yep. Those people are better equipped to answer those questions. He can't. The information he received from doctors is hearsay. Yeah, uh, It's not hearsay. I didn't ask what they said. I just asked if you talked to the doctors, Robert. Sure. So the question that's pending isn't asking for hearsay. I think the objection was made because it sounds like that's where we're headed. Yep, so it's going to elicit here. Um, answer the question that was just asked. And then um, I'll just indicate, Mr. Fairley, that objection is probably coming if you go over the next step. But the question that's pending can be answered. So I think the question was, did you talk to anybody at Nicolay? I did. <coughs> Ask another question. Okay. The judge um, is like, we're just going to keep this did real Taylor, tight. Taylor live with you in, in Green Bay for a while? For a little bit, yeah. Was that in 2021 or what year was it? I believe so, yeah. But uh, again, uh, speaking to them and you know her being an adult, they really even wouldn't being a doctor wouldn't allow to correct. disclose anything. Right. You know? Correct. Sure. Uh, when she lived with you, sir, what address did she live with you at? 1130 Maureen Way. And how long did she live with you? Just a few months. Did you ever, did it ever come to a point where you didn't want her to stay there anymore because her behaviors were getting worse or her These are mental waiting. status was getting worse? Nobody's no. objecting. I love my daughter. So I'll do whatever it takes to help her out. And the jury will uh, appreciate that as well. Did you ever well. review any of her uh, records at all? Objection. I don't think he can testify to the content. Of, again, I think it's the same objection. He can answer whether he reviewed them. He can't answer anything about the content. Of the Your Honor, the state, what they're trying to do is they're trying to anticipate an objection. They know this one is not an objectionable one, in my opinion. And any good parent, when you go to the doctor, you're going to talk with the, the physician or the psychologist or whoever it is. Um, about that doesn't the make me a physician or a psychiatrist. So, uh, it's not like I didn't try. I, you know, I tried to hold her. Wait. So I'm going to, I'm going to overrule the objection at this point. <laughs> she was not happy with her as her defense attorney is getting riled. She is also getting riled, which is the defense is like, Your Honor, they are anticipating objections. Well, yes, they do that. They're I'm just asking that. It's not like I didn't try. I, you know, I tried to hold her. Wait. So I'm going to, I'm going to overrule the objection at this point. And yeah. Asked. Mr. Freelich, why don't you ask it again so that the witness has it in his mind? Okay, Your Honor. I kind of forgot, so hopefully the... Did you review the, some of the records? <laughs> Did uh, you review any of the records? Like at the at the facility? Yes. Um, again, she was an adult at the time, and I can't... Yeah, they're not going to give you much. You know, the yeah, she was, was no, she was... Yeah. Okay. She when she was living um, at your house, sir, on Moraine Way, was she ever experiencing or... <sighs> Experiencing any hallucinations or anything like, like that? Um, uh, yeah. How Can you tell me know? about that? Uh, just know that she wasn't in the right frame of mind. You know, she, you know, kind of see things. She liked to walk around, and you know, we take a walk, cemetery, just right down the street. But um, she just needed, you know, just to kind of get out casually, and just walk around and strolling in the cemetery, ease her mind. As one Did you does. have concerns about her from a physical or mental standpoint? Always. Okay. Always. All right. Thank you. Nothing further. I appreciate that. Do you have any cross-examination? Um, just I briefly, think, um, I Mr. Think, Coronado. I think everyone has concerns for their children from a physical and mental standpoint. I want my children to be well and safe, and it's scary raising children. I think that can be said for everyone. Oh, boy. Were you aware of whether or not your daughter was uh, employed during the time that she was residing with you on Moraine Way? I, she was not at the time at that um, do you know uh, anything about her employment history as an adult? Sure. And had she held jobs in the past? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, do you know where she worked? She worked for Saputo. She worked a couple years, Saputo, three and a half years probably. And is that relatively recently? Where? Uh, prior to her arrest, of course. That, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah, right. Prior to that. Yeah, and she was doing really well there, too, until her uh, boyfriend slash husband got out of jail. That turned everything upside down. Yeah. In part because of the methamphetamine. Wait, till her boyfriend slash husband got out of jail. So, so dad has a feeling some kind of way 
about the husband. Is the husband not a legal marriage? He is, right? Yep. Um, so Taylor was doing pretty well, and then she started using the drugs. He might have said school. No further questions. Pretty, pretty bad drug, too. Anything uh, on that, Mr. Freilich? What was the drug? The meth. Meth, heroin, whatever else. I don't know. Meth is a pretty bad drug. Yes. Marijuana? Yeah, I don't know. The kid was already doing that shit before. And... Ooh, dad does just not. Loser and he got my daughter involved in that shit. Okay. Thank you, sir. I was just about to say, dad does not like this dude. Um, and that was before dad testified he's a fucking loser and got my daughter involved in that shit. So I was going to back up because I was talking over dad saying uh, exactly how he felt. I could read that. I didn't know he was going to just say that dad does not like the dude um so taylor was doing pretty well and then she started using the drugs yeah no further questions pretty, pretty bad drug too anything uh on that mr freilich what was the drug no meth meth heroin whatever else i don't know marijuana yeah, i don't know the kid was already doing that shit before and oof just a fucking loser and he got my daughter involved in that shit okay thank you sir Nothing else. Hang on. Okay. okay, thank you. You can step down. Okay. Well, we know how Dad feels about it. Yeah, I love you too. She said, "Love you too." So we probably said, "I love you" as he was walking out. I call up uh, Dr. Diane Litton, PhD. Your Honor. Okay. Okay. Well. Um, yeah, I saw her. I think she was throwing up a I love you sign to her dad. That's what it looked like to me. Um, so yes, I saw that. Yes, I'm watching her. Um, who dad, dad hates the, uh, the boyfriend husband who I presume to be the baby father. What was the reason? I, I don't know why she's doing the things she's doing in court. There was a cross up for the father. It was very brief. There was a very brief cross examination of the father. The father had more to say when asked by the defense. There's not much to say for the father. Okay. Because again, the dad is, this is his daughter. He loves his daughter. He said that. Okay, doctor, if you want to just step right up over here. So there's not really much to cross-examine on him, that. Right up over here. Was dad in a prison jumpsuit? Yes. Dad is in custody. Dad was also shackled. They didn't ask about it at all. They're not going to ask about it at all. But dad was shackled. And the dad seems very pissed because it seems that he feels that the boyfriend is who got her into drugs. And that might very, very well be the case. Or it might not be. The dad thinks it is. So. Wait, was it really Poodle, Talia? She might have been working at a cheese company. Spudo! Diane Litton? Not Poodle. Okay, Mr. Freilich, then the witness is yours. Thank you, Your Honor. Oh, Good morning. Okay. Morning. Say your name for the record again. Diane Litton. We'll look up the, the dad that? stuff. L Y I mean. T T O N. And what is your occupation? I'm an independent forensic psychologist. Um, where is your office? In Oshkosh, Wisconsin. God, I love um, I love the way she PhD? said that. I am. Does that make you a licensed psychologist? Well, I earned the PhD first and then became a licensed psychologist. Okay. Um, if anyone gives this woman shit about being board certified, I might start throwing things. I'm just saying. Could you briefly provide me with your educational background? Sure. I have a, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD doctoral degree. In all three are in the field of psychology. How long have you been a licensed psychologist? Uh, June 1993. And uh, did you work? For UW Madison, I was a during my PhD program at UW Madison. I was a during the graduate program. I was what's called a research research assistant for the professors for my professor. 
So that was my work when I was getting my PhD. Okay. Um, initially, when you be, when you got your PhD, where did you work? I worked for the University of Wisconsin initially in an internship, administrative internship to University of Wisconsin system. I did that for a year, and then I became a a, a research scientist at UW Madison. Did you work at Mendota Mental Health Institute? I did. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Um, after taking off about five years for family matters, I then retrained to become a clinical licensed psychologist. And I that took me 3,000 hours at Mendota Mental Health Institute in Madison. And then they hired me as a staff psychologist. And I so I was at Mendota from 19, for about seven years, 1991 until 1997, when I became independent forensic psychologist. And I was a therapist too for some years. And by years independent, too. she means okay. working independently, um, not associated a, with uh, a mental health facility psychologist, or university. Do you conduct uh, NGI evaluations, competency evaluations, uh, psychological evaluations? Yes. He speaks so hot into the um, mic. What kind of patients did you treat as a forensic psychologist? A variety. The ones inpatient at Mendota Mental Health Institute in Madison, um, we used to have the what called the adult and well teenage and child, not forensic units, but child units. I was on for a while I was on a juvenile adolescent unit and then I worked for a couple years on what's called a civil unit, adults. Uh, they're no longer at Mendota now. But then the last part of that seven years I was in the forensic units. People who were committed under the insanity NGI, and then also, so most of the patients I dealt with were had been found not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, and the other patients were there for competency to proceed to trial evaluation. So I, I had both. Did you also and deal with guardianships? With her. Uh, not at well peripherally when I worked at Mendota, but since being privately employed, I've done I do numerous guardianship evaluations for Ottawa County. Had you also been involved in? Uh doing sex offender evaluations as well? Yes. Eh. Now, what? Um, you have yeah. a curriculum vitae, correct? What? Yeah, very small one. Yeah. Counsel. And you did provide that to me. She threw a chair yes. at this woman, yes. She threw a chair, this is the woman she threw a chair at. Um, she is, this defendant has had multiple competency well, evaluations. We're starting over with numbers, we're this is in addition to the um, in addition to the evaluations for NGI. Mark, I have permission to approach. You may. Thank you. Dr. Lindsay, I'll show you what's about They're going through her resume, yes. which is, is that's my brief uh, education resume. And, uh, university. Does your resume or inpatient curriculum vitae contain works with uh, the court system and now information works about your educational background? Yes. Does it contain information about uh, other uh, patients or cases you've worked on? I think well, did I it summarizes like my jobs too, over since the overhead lights 1975. Me, so. So, yeah. Okay. I and the type of cases as a, that I do for the last 32 years. This okay. is the and your license is witness. still in effect, correct? Yes. Is everything in that curriculum vitae exhibit one true and accurate as of today? Okay. Well, except I wasn't able to do the online renewal of my American Psychological Association membership. I found that out this year, so I had to call them up and do that. So that's the only thing. As far as I know, that's the only thing that's not accurate. But your, your license in the state of Wisconsin. Correct. Offer exhibit one. I couldn't figure out the online no. system to fix that. Sorry, y'all. Now, were you provided with uh, some brief background information about this case? Yes. And um, were you provided information from uh, prior counsel and from me? Yes. <clears throat> what kinds of um, information did you review in this case? It was voluminous, and I asked for more information, too. Uh, the records, though, discovery included uh, the criminal complaints for the offense, uh, prior uh, offenses I want to know from how long 2020. She worked with That's this the police defendant. records I'm in the curious. formal criminal complaint. Um, and then inpatient, a 21-day inpatient psychiatric hospitalization at uh, Nicolay. Can, can I stop you right there? Did you receive those documents? Yes. Did you receive uh, the order for civil commitment? Yes. Did you receive an order for psychotropic medications for Taylor Shavizis? Yes. And you looked at those legal documents? Yes. What year was that? Do you know? Yeah, which, pardon, which year? When, when those orders were entered, the civil commitment order? Uh, 2021, I believe. For yep. six we would have, I have not looked order for civil commitment and the order to treat. So. 
I do not know. All right. Tara Kay shared with us that she worked at Spudo Cheese Factory, not Poodle, as the closed captioning told uh, us. Um, we oh, will. Yeah, I need to look up what the dad is in custody for. I do not. Place. I have not looked. Um, Brown County Records. Dad was arrested. Seven eight twenty twenty three is in jail and Two charged with is a uh, state we'll of Wisconsin Brown County order of commitment. Is that for Taylor Shabizas? Yes. And exhibit three. We'll talk about that the is evaluations a state of Wisconsin break. Brown County order for involuntary medication and treatment. Is that for Taylor Shabizas? Yes. Is that from 2021? It yes. We're caught up to real time. It was. Do those documents indicate that she was mentally ill at that time? Yes. And that she was court ordered to take some medications. Exactly. Are those documents that you reviewed as part of your evaluation in this case? Yes. Offer exhibits two and three. Any objections? No. Two and three will be received. So generally medical records do so, not come um, in as evidence. Dr. Litton, this you is can carry on. What other uh, documents? This is different because as part of your evaluation? this is the phase of the trial here to determine this. I reviewed, That's why they're um, The other evaluators in this case, um, their reports, um, and then uh, the two inpatient Hos psychiatric hospitalizations from Bellin. She business was found guilty yesterday afternoon. The jury deliberated about 40 um, minutes. I reviewed probably um, a little less voluminous um, school records, which I don't often get in these cases. But the school records for Miss She business covered kindergarten through 11th grade and all the behavior incidences. So I think that's about it. And then the prep for Vea. We've asked for those records, but they haven't been received yet. Did you review uh, Nicolay Psychiatric Nicolay Psychiatric Center records from uh, through Brown County? Yes. Did you review the report from Dr. Christina Engine? Yes. Dr. Tracy Lucetta? Yes. Dr. Matthew T. Seipel? Yes. Dr. Deborah Collins? Yes. Those are all um, the defendant psychologists, correct? Multiple. Yes, they are. Competency you evaluations. Also review, did you also review uh, the criminal complaints and police reports and other uh, case materials? Yes. Uh-oh. What is closed captioning doing? Were you able to, um, well, before I get into are that. Are they saying Taylor Swift did you instead prepare of Taylor Swift two, business? Uh, tables, so I to did. speak? Okay. Yes. Can you tell me what the tables are? The simpler table, one page, is um, Ms. Shabusiness's mental health history with just the names of the records, the date of the treatment, if it was known, her age at the Doc, time. I am also and then the concerned, but this is the woman that had a chair thrown at her, so she must have seen the, the defendant at some time. So that was the one page. And then the other one was prepared by her school. and. It reflects um, sixth grade through um, 11th grade, but this is just the table that the school had prepared. I had also, though, reviewed her kindergarten through fifth grade. So this table is sixth grade through 11th, but I also reviewed kindergarten through fifth grade. When we talk about too. your permanent record. And uh, you brought these tables here they and have provided them to me, correct? Yes. And they've been provided to the state. Reviewed this woman's records I back guess. to kindergarten. Were they provided to the state? Yes, they were. Okay, yes. Yes, you, I, yeah, you told me that. Thank you. Can I approach your honor? You may. Thank you. All right. Um, as for the defendant's facial expressions, y'all, I don't know. I think I look like that under bright lights. Courtroom lights are really uncomfortable. And without my Exhibit glasses, that's exactly what I would look like. So one page I don't read much into it. Taylor Shabusiness mental health history with For the me. record the information came from, no. the date, right. if it's known, of uh, inpatient 
or jail records, her approximate age, ages, and then the, the conditions during that either treat psychiatric treatment or in jail, the conditions, uh, if they did make any a diagnosis of her, and then medications, if there were medications prescribed. So that's what Exhibit 4 is. Could you take me through that in a little bit more detail as to the treatments she received and the medications? Yes. Um, and from the age of about seven through 14. Here are the permanent records. She was treated, and again, I'm, I can't remember how the P R E V A A pre Previa? Pre Previa, um, here in Green Bay or this area. Uh, probably outpatient, so ages about 7 to 14, and we know the 14 is definite. Um, she was seen for, and she was under psychiatric care, and I believe therapy, I think, counseling, uh, for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, depression, and she was begun on Zoloft, an antidepressant, two to three weeks when she was 14 before the admission to Bellin. So that's on the next line. Bellin, Bellin Health Psychiatric Center Adolescent Unit. She was there for three days, 2012, age 14. Judge Abbey says hello, the, Chad. From the medical records, the conditions that they saw, the psychiatrists, the mental health people at Bellin, a thought disturbance, hallucinations, delusions, suicidal, depression. They're going to talk about everything that is in her She chart. was initially All of it. diagnosed <clears throat> with bipolar one, depression, severe, with psychosis. She was put on an antipsychotic medication, Seroquel, and they discontinued the Zoloft that she had been taking two to three days, or excuse me, two to three weeks before the admission. And the reason they discontinued the antidepressant medication is sometimes it can trigger worse symptoms in a person with bipolar. When she was discharged after the three days, no longer suicidal. She was then diagnosed with a mood disorder, not otherwise specified, without psychosis, but still the psychiatrist noted there was still some paranoia. You want me to just continue? Sure. Okay. The next admission psychiatric was to the same facility, Bellin Health Psychiatric Center Adolescent Unit inpatient. That was for three days, two years later, in 2014. She had, she was diagnosed with a mood disorder with prior history of psychosis. She had a history of diagnosis of mood disorder, suicidal, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, history of hypomania, and marijuana use daily. She was prescribed medications to treat some medications, lithobid, there to um, there to manage bipolar disorder. She was prescribed Abilify, which is an antipsychotic medication, and they stopped the Seroquel that she had been on since the age of 14. The next a long time. is St. Mary's emergency room. She was there for just a brief visit, the ER, March, 22nd, 2021. She was 23 years old. She was observed to have hallucinations, paranoia, 
delusions. I'm not surprised she's not thrilled about her entire and mental health history using, being made public. Most or she most history, defendants are. It I might be their best using at that time. Their best marijuana, option. But it doesn't mean methamphetamine. Like it. It's not comfortable. Okay. So that was one day at the ER. Then wait, why was she at the ER though? In and I believe if if I have this right, I believe she was in jail. You, ma'am, you need to have it 20, right. 20 offenses, and I believe she was she went to the emergency room in 2021 from the jail because of the the psycho the psychosis. Okay, then. Then we have the Nicolay Psychiatric Center inpatient uh, from March 22nd. They generally can't. 2021. Nobody's objected. Until April 12th. It's going to come in. 2021. They're going through her history. And these. At that time. I will say these, these medical records are evidence in a different way than different phases of trial because they are the jury is here to decide so these are going to be in evidence so she can go through and explain the records because the records are also in evidence different than what we've seen in other trials if that helps hopefully that helps she had a six month civil commitment with an order to treat which was what those but that was once she was already in custody for two this two and four were i think okay this was 2021 for 20, 21 days. The records indicate bipolar disorder, substance use, hallucinations, delusional paranoia. She was initially on Abilify that she had been prescribed since age 16 and again she she was 23 during the 21 day at 23 years old during the 21 days at nicolay so they kept her i believe they kept her on abilify an antipsychotic medication but then put her on an injected to to make it easier so you, you get the injections of an antipsychotic, Aristata, I think, Aristata. Was, was this while she it. was in custody? A R I S T A D A. They put her on that, uh, so she, hoping that she'd be more compliant. Easier, you go, go to the psychiatrist, it, get a shot. I, I don't remember if it's every three, once a week. How, some was of that while she was in custody, month. though? Because so I'm not sure about that one at all. It's much easier for them um, daily medication. And I think I said she was she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, substance use, had hallucinations, <laughs> delusional paranoia. The last hallucinations records, and paranoia are going to play the more jail, in to hear Brown anything County else. Brown County Jail mental health records. That was from a stay. She's three she months is just reading this. She is not explaining it well, which is why June it's kind of hard to, to follow. September 2020. I get it. When all of you are like, <gasps> she was 22 years old, and that regarded 2020 offenses, criminal. She was noted to be suicidal. They have not addressed the defendant's previous uh, record. So it's interesting that some of those are coming in through like she was in custody for offenses in 2020. And that's why she was getting this treatment. Cause some of this is from her prior, uh, custody contacts. I, I have not gone deeply through her, uh, prior record, but there was some bail jumping and stuff like that. So there were, she has had other contacts with law enforcement before this happened. Bizarre behaviors hallucinations and yeah, everyone this is dr curry methamphetamine and heroin then from the ages of 24 to 25 currently yeah she has to keep the jury's attention records from the jail were this from current, january 4th this part 2022 
to July 9th, 2023. She had, and I'm getting these from their mental health records, psychiatrists, uh, mental health people at the jail. They noted she had suicidal ideation, bizarre, self-injurious behaviors, many conduct reports. She sounds like she's she was nonverbal. Many conduct and reports. Isolative, ma'am, in her cell she, at times. She didn't really like being in custody. She smeared and drew oh, on God. her cell walls with with feces. Yeah. And menstrual blood. She was naked at times. She had hallucinations. The hallucinations intense being the bigger part. Anger at times. Of that. She was prescribed Respirdol, an antipsychotic medication for, quote, psychosis and impulse control. But she was usually non compliant. That's then I not surprising. as far as I know the antipsychotic olanzapine is currently her medication prescribed at the jail, but she is typically been non compliant with taking it. And that's it for that exhibit. I mean I figured once they got into the you, drawing uh, in the walls. Generate a report in this particular case? Yes. <laughs> I um I actually expected menstrual blood first, not necessarily feces, but that's just based on my own, you know, experience with people in custody. Uh, I was expecting that, but not, not surprised. Um, it's whether or not those are volitional acts and whether or not the behavior post arrest indicates that she did not appreciate and cannot abide by the law um, at the time of the murders. But, I don't think this witness has done a good job of explaining any of that to the jury. She's read in the record. You're going to need to, uh, you're going to need to explain more. Some of them have already been admitted. I'm assuming the only one that hasn't been admitted is four. Okay. Any objection? No. Thank you, Art. Dr. Litton, um, you prepared a written report, correct? Yes. And was that dated July 3rd of 2023? Yes. Was it 15 pages? July 3rd. Uh, about that, yes. Did you sign it? Yes. Oh, nine pages. <laughs> um, you did review I don't think the defendant uh, likes this woman's tone. medical and mental health history, correct? Yes. I don't know if Her I like this witness's tone. Correct. Yes. Her family and social background, is that fair? Yes. Alcohol, drug abuse, and education? Yes. Uh, sexual, physical abuse history, fair? Yeah. Yes. Jobs? Yes. Charges? Yes. Um. Yeah, her Tell tone, me about her tone the is, first interview that you did with her. Her tone is not ideal. That took place um, February 7th, two attempted interviews, February 7th, 2023, at the jail in a conference room. Uh, she remained nonverbal the entire time when I attempted to interview her. She's like, I don't want to talk to you. And she suddenly ran to the corner of the room, picked up a plastic chair and threw it at me. I called the guards, um, took them a couple minutes to get there. She sat down, I sat down, tried to calmly ask her why she threw the chair. She again was nonverbal. The guards came. I explained the situation. They initially said, yes, I should terminate the interview, but offered the possibility 
of taking Miss Shabiznis to a secure booth to see if she'd interview. She nodded that she would be willing to go there and talk to me. We got there and she again was nonverbal. That was the first two attempted interviews, February 7th, 2023. So you had two interviews with her on that day? Two on that day. One, the one interview was that in a, a room with just you and her and a table? Yeah. Yes. And at the, in that interview room, they have a stack of chairs there? One chair in the corner. Okay. Why? Um, that seems and like then later you went maybe to a, a, problem. a more secure area where there was glass. Did you talk to her there? I tried to, and she again was nonverbal. Yeah, she didn't want to talk to you. We got it. Um, that was before I got involved. Is that fair? Exactly. Um, then did you have the occasion to meet with her on a different date? I did. When the form or the form... The last attorney, the original attorney on the case, after she threw the chair at me, was nonverbal on February 7th, 2023. Her defense attorney went, like the next day, went to discuss things about, you know, why did you throw the chair? She didn't have an explanation. Um, I mean, but she agreed say, and she I was verbal really to the defense much. attorney. She told him, yes, she would then interview with me. He said, I'll come back tomorrow to double check. He returned, I guess, the next day. She again said she was verbal with him and agreed that she'd interview with me. So I returned on February 13th, 2023, and she refused to even come to the interview room. No, she, yeah. So those were the first three attempted the interviews. The way they are using nonverbal and the way others may use it, she is using it to mean was refusing, there an refusing occasion, to participate. Uh, were you she was refusing to participate. Not I did, yes. When was that? Unable to participate. Um, she just didn't want to. Yes, Chad, I agree. Maybe she should have brought muffins. On June 19th. Probably wouldn't be allowed in custody. And was that at the Brown County Jail? Yes. In the interview room? In the conference room, yes. Okay. And what is the conference room? Can you describe the layout there? Um, you not a huge room, but there's a there's a, a yeah, table. She was choosing not to participate. A bigger table in the middle, um, and plastic chairs. Thank goodness, plastic chairs. Um, and then there was that the people sit on, um, and then you know one plastic chair in the corner. You know, not a huge conference room. Um, from the incident on February 7th, where the chair was thrown at you, did you have some safety concerns, precautions? Yeah. With her or me? Or, yes. Uh, she had, um, she was handcuffed to a waist belt. But I mean, did you have concerns from the incident on February 7th, where the chair was thrown at you? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. First she time was... in 32 years, a chair's anybody anybody i've interviewed ever did that okay. so on june 19th of 2023 you had another interview with her yes did you make any requests at all um well for you to be there um but you know you had already met with her several times um she seems to have a better she had working not been relationship aggressive with you with this attorney than uh, the other attorney. ideally i wanted to meet with her in that conference room as opposed to behind plexiglass in a little tiny booth. Um, so that, you know, so yeah, the June 19th, 2023 interview. I'm speeding it up because I keep pausing. Talk, was in that conference So we can catch back up. And you asked me to sit in? Yes, I did. Did I interfere in any way? No. And so tell me a little bit about that interview on June 19th of 2023. Uh, we only, you know, we were, I was only with her for two hours. Um, That's a fairly short evaluation. She had a great deal of trouble, difficulty with paying attention and concentrating. My impression of her, ma'am, at that two-hour interview, have you ignored was, her ADHD diagnosis? She the fact was that she psychotic. clearly does not like you. She had visual, auditory hearing, visual hallucinations, auditory hallucinations. She was delusional. 
She was paranoid. She answered some of my questions. She, my, my impression of her was that she was really trying to answer questions and she was verbal. This time she spoke with me. She was verbal, but my impression and that was that she was really trying to answer my questions, but her thinking was very, what we call disorganized, very delusional. She was she's... actively hallucinating. Oh, I'm trying not to be judgy, things. but the train, way that this victim, uh, the way that loud this train witness, whistle that she this is screaming, expert says which she things told me she hears in the courtroom difficult. too. Um, very, as the, as the two hours went on, she became so distracted and very, you know, afraid. You could see it on her face, fear, because of the delusions she was experiencing right then. Um, and the, she got more and more scared about what she thought. She saw a train and of this louder, louder, louder whistle. So after thank, two hours, that thank was you, Dr. Barry. She was so, in my, my impression was that she was so I'm distressed. Trying. I didn't want to continue the interview then you're i felt i would be inflicting more harm on her if i continued i wondered if interview. she was also worried for her so safety. she gave me some information um about her about her bipolar condition her mental health history family yeah that Doc, was, dr Litton, thank you was um do you have an opinion on whether or not miss shabizis's memory for remote or recent events was impaired when yes you her? yes tell me about that a little bit not only did this I see the that heart of memory the issues, impairment in the two hour interview, but it's in, I see it in her records too. Um, she can sometimes remember remote events, like, you know, pretty well where, where she lived, approximate dates, the approximate time her mother died. And so the, the date when she got married, uh, roughly, it's a little fuzzy, but yeah, better remote memory, but she often, will in the same interview with treaters, evaluators, she'll be confused. And I saw memory impairments during the two hours, memory gaps, um, kind of a person with bipolar disorder or a psychotic, other psychotic disorder like schizophrenia, when they're actively psychotic, Ma'am, we has she sometimes been see memory gaps for the time they were very psychotic or with bipolar. Ma'am, are you talking about this defendant? Bipolar or one people in general? Ma'am, in a manic state, they can often forget what's going on. Then when they come out of the psychosis, they'll try to. Sometimes they'll have a spotty memory. Sometimes the whole memory will come back of when, what they were doing, what happened during the psychotic episode. But sometimes it's totally blank. Sometimes it comes partially back. Can you explain and this defendant's behavior though? They try to reconstruct what happened and you get a kind of a funny reconstruction. How do they explain their behavior when they were manic with bipolar or psychotic from schizophrenia for example they'll try to they'll do a funny not funny haha -ha, but bizarre Odd? reconstruction well let's see if i did that if if i got married while i was psychotic well let's Ma see ma'am i must have liked the guy or i've seen i've heard some really odd from this defendant issues from this what about her speech can you give me any commentary on her speech from oh. uh, the observations you made her speech is generally, you can understand, I could understand her. Um, she generally speaks in what we call connected sentences. I wanted to cover so this. Can, I wanted you know, to cover this. You can this. understand her speech. This. She's not, there's a, I one of, I chose, you know, there's another I chose to do this term, today. word salad for somebody who's psychotic, who just, blah, blah, blah. you can't understand. Ma'am, we're familiar salad. with the word I've salad. Never, in her records and when i interviewed her she's never been like that so you can understand her speech and she'll speak in brief what we call connected sentences sometimes they're logical lucid but other times not they don't make sense well they're they don't make sense to track. you 
they're whatever we're talking about poof it, it, she goes off track and says something totally different are you are you saying it's that she probably goes logical to her though i'm just just ma'am just because you cannot follow her train of thought does, does it might just mean that you're not on the train i'm just saying but i'm a streamer with adhd so i understand the fact that sometimes we we go this way and i get it it's not that I don't agree with what this witness is saying. It's that the manner in which she is saying it is off-putting to me, and I am trying to follow her, but yay. It's off on tangents? It very much so, yes. Uh, not always, but yes, I observe that in, uh, in the records, too. When you discuss certain topics, is she connected or disconnected? The judge's face. Is sometimes, telling. like in the two hour interview, sometimes she, and again, my impression was they're that not she connected tried to you. Really hard to answer my questions. Sometimes she was I'm connected trying really hard to what at I was moment. saying and to reality. Other times, no, definitely not connected, in my, my impression. During I'm, the um, I'm trying, two hour I'm interview I'm that trying. you had with her on June 19th, um, was she distracted by any? internal or external stimuli yes tell me a little bit more about that she was distracted by a clock on the and this is one of these tangents chat a clock on the ma'am ma'am if that was a really loud clock i don't know i am not a psychiatrist i am someone who's highly distractible with auditory stimulus chat have you ever been distracted by a clock or a watch tell me because i have i sure the fuck have room wall she was distracted by a cord we had just been talking about i have past suicide attempts and she had tried apparently to hang herself so when she was a teenager or younger and she was distracted by a cord and that's not an easy thing to discuss ma'am to hang herself with that cord but she was she said i i I'm controlling it though. She had a train. She thought she saw a train and the and a whistle that got louder and louder and louder. She was delusional in her thinking. So those are just some examples. Did you ask her about her mood on a scale of one to ten? I did. And what was the response she got? 007, 007, which was bizarre. And I, I think a reference to James Bond. What can you take from that? Or, or my impression. She was talking about was the prosecutor that, looking know, like O'Malley from Grey's Anatomy. Tangent. Maybe. And, uh, you know, it sounds if She has started calling the prosecutor bizarre, 007. I'm going I asked to her to clarify that. And she really didn't. It led into a discussion of mania, bipolar one mania. And we discussed that, her impressions of bipolar and has she ever had a manic episode? Um, <clears throat> is obsessive compulsive disorder a, a, a mental disorder or issue? Is it for her or just in general? Just in general. We're going to talk yes, about malingering, I'm sure, on cross-examination. Did you talk to her about any uh, compulsive behaviors or any Has issues like that? Has she been diagnosed with yes. compulsive behaviors? Tell me about that. I brought up the issue of hypersexuality. Also, just obsessive-compulsive symptoms, traits. And she said sometimes she, she's will touch her hair a lot. She'll wash her hands 30 feel, to 40 times with germs. But then I asked her about hypersexuality, which is sometimes seen in a person with bipolar one disorder when they're in a manic state, manic psychotic state, this um, hyper too much interest arousal with regarding something sexual. And she she was very surprised. She had never heard of that. Um, 
but she clicked on it. It was interesting. She clicked on it like, oh, and then she described some past uh, obsessiveness in, I think she said in 2020, for about a year when she and her husband viewed a lot, and she called, yeah, obsessive, uh, adult pornography. Ma'am? Does uh, hypersexuality uh, give you concern or pause as it relates to mental health issues? It does because, and this wasn't the additional evidence about it that she has likely, well, in my opinion, she has had hypersexuality during the bipolar disorder, you know, when she was diagnosed at least age 14, but probably before that. She had, she made inappropriate sexual comments in her classrooms while growing up at school. Then when she was inpatient, I believe the 21 days, I have questions days, about the think rest it was of her history was with 20, this though. 21, she was inappropriate. They caught her in the bathroom, two separate incidences with a male two different male patients. Um, I think there's some been some. Did you also say it was inappropriate the with the male I don't patients? Exactly. I have questions. Um, but yes, that, that's definitely a concern. I've seen other people. I, I don't want to know about other people. By, it, I want to know about inpatient, her. Outpatient. And I want to know about the rest of her history. Sexual and again, associated with bipolar mania, manic episode or could be schizophrenia, but so this doctor typically has not done disorder. the testing I've that like we saw that, with Dr. Curry. Mendota, She's done a two hour interview. She has attempted another interview and she has done a document it's review. Not incredibly common, but it can, it's one of the you know, classic symptoms of a bipolar manic episode. Did uh, Ms. Shabiza <laughs> say anything about her thinking and her feelings on that? Yes. What did she talk to you about? Uh, you mean during that two hour interview? Yes. Yeah, and I, I'd have to look at her the exact quotes here, but she, the thinking, um, she hears screaming in the courtroom. It sounds like quite constant, she said. Um, she, I'm looking here, yeah, she said she re, she reported she hears screaming all day long and not from the other jail inmates, telling her to wake up. Screaming happens, quote, a lot when she goes to court. It, quote, very much so, end of quote, affects her ability to concentrate on a daily basis and when in the courtroom. And then the voices, the screaming, are scary and tell her to do stuff. Is this leading? Yes. So is the prosecution objecting? No. Everyone is, just wants to get through this. It's I always ask people, I evaluate, how is your thinking and memory? Um and to me, um Sometimes a, it's just, a patient um, can't assess the their own thinking, thinking and memory is, themselves. It's so difficult that's why for her to think. Testing is because of the generally needed the bipolar symptoms of psychosis. Thinking it affects her attention, her concentration, and so, messes up her thinking. I would like to know more about her yeah. history. I, I don't think she did any assessments. As part of your with this complete analysis in this case, did you find that? Taylor Shabizis was uh, is married. Yes. And did she <clears throat> provide you with any there will information be a about the, you know, about the marital relationship? There will be a cross examination. Yes. What does she say about that? She said that I hate to say this about someone not here, but she said that her spouse, who I believe they married in 2020, got her involved in methamphetamine. Use. Her, da her dad's kind of testified to that. 
Um, and he was, um, again, she, her reports about this vary, her but perceptions matter in this part she of this trial. She has reported that he was very physically abusive, hit her. Well, he, she told me that he hit her on the head numerous times. That was when I was evaluating her, any head injuries ever in your past. And she, she mentioned that he had hit her on the head numerous times. Um, so very controlling person. And she had gone to a neighbor's house at one time in 2020 to ask them to call 911. And uh, another neighbor, when the police came, another neighbor said that he was. That's a she lot of hearsay. Them both, and she said, That's yeah, he was abusive, controlling. A whole drug bunch. pusher, addict. Yeah. That's a whole anyway, but she is bunch still of married. I think I believe there's but she was going saying. to um in twenty twenty, um she was going to get try to get the marriage annulled, but I, I don't think that's happened at this point. While you're changing uh, topics, I think we'll take our mid morning break. We started a little bit later, but it's quarter to eleven right oh, now. So we've been on for about an hour and a half. We'll take about a 10 minute break. Uh, so all rise. I need a break. <sighs> I, I wanted to cover this today. Before we uh, recess, no, thank you. Really? All right, thank you. All right, we're uh, reconvene at uh, 11 o'clock. Okay, we're in recess. Great, you. we have a 10 minute break. Oh, okay, let's take a stretch break. Oh gosh. Y'all. All of the dopamine has been sucked out of my brain this morning. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to try to give a recap. I'm going to try to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to try to give a recap of, of where we're at. I, I'm going to, I'm going to try. I wanted to cover this. I, ch I chose this. I, I did. I did. We're going to get there. Y'all we're not at cross examination yet. We're going to get, we're going to get there. For those of you that are are just tuning in, we are in the second part of the Taylor Shabiznes trial. She was convicted yesterday of all of the um, allegations, all of the charges, including first degree intentional homicide. We are now in the NGI or not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect phase. And we have had the, we are now on the defense's second witness. I think this is their last witness. The defendant's father testified this morning this is the defense's forensic psychologist who has done a record review and seemingly had a two-hour interview with the defendant, but has not, it seems, done any other testing. I don't know if this defendant would have complied with any further testing. The defense hasn't asked that. We have not gotten to cross-examination yet. The standard the jury must decide, and this is the same jury that decided guilt yesterday, is whether or not there is a reasonable certainty by the greater weight of credible evidence that this defendant at the time that the crime was committed had a mental disease or defect that meant that they could not perceive the wrongness of their actions or were incapable of complying their behavior to the laws of our society. Antisocial conduct is not enough. So this witness is trying to explain the diagnoses and medical history of this defendant except is not doing it 
in a way that is really easy to follow for me. She has not clearly stated what the diagnoses are. She has thrown other things in there. I, I don't know some of the diagnoses this defendant has or does not have. Uh, it's interesting to watch. Not all witnesses are the witnesses we are going to see in a multi-million dollar high profile trial. This has been a different kind of testimony, but this is what the jury has to sit through and try to figure out if at the time of the murders, this defendant was acting truly out of like psychosis or out of um, hallucination where she didn't know what she was doing was wrong and or could not conform her behavior um, to the law. That is what the jury has to decide. I'm interested to see cross-examination. Um, this has not been easy to, to follow. And I don't think it's been easy or clear for the jury. I think what the jury has taken away at this point is that there is a long history here of um, different kinds of medications that this defendant has been on, multiple different kinds of uh, compliance or non-compliance, that there is also a history of, of illicit drug use, and then that, um, I don't know where we ended. That was, that, I don't know. That was that. We'll see how they wrap it up. I really hope that the defense brings back around a, okay, so at the time of the crime, what is it your opinion that Taylor Shabiznis had this mental disease or defect and was not able to perceive these things. And I hope that they bring it around to this, this professional's opinion. The defense or the prosecution has multiple witnesses as well to refute it. And we will see. The dad's testimony was much easier. All right, let's get to questions because we're at a, like a five more minute break. You've got questions. I've got questions. We've got lots of super chats to get to. Debbie said she knew it was wrong. So does this matter? The defense is arguing she did not know it was wrong. Her own behavior and statements to police kind of contradict that. And that's what's going to happen in closing arguments. I really just want to get through. I really just want to get through this witness. It's, it's not easy testimony to follow. And it's also she, as the doctor was getting into, she got distracted by the ticking clock. I was just, I was at that point like, ma'am, 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 ma'am. Okay. But also we have, a, we have a highly neurodivergent audience. So who amongst us have not been distracted by the sounds in the world around them. It's probably much fewer than those of us that are distracted. The way that I hate, we have a drink fridge and it is the growliest goddamn fridge in the world. And I, there are times I can hear it from across the house and I'm like, I have to buy a new one. Like I, this one is, is, is too loud for me. My husband is also not highly distracted by noise. He's like, oh, I'll just run the, you know, the washer and dryer before we go to bed. I'm like, the fuck you will, because I will hear it until it is done and I will not be able to fall asleep. But um, that's just my brain. So <sighs> ticking clocks bug the heck out of me. Is that actually a symptom of something? I think a lot of us are are distractible by noise in different ways, depending on what it is. Um, but it it is also a, I know that with my ADHD, being highly distracted by noise is one of those aspects. Um, I was going to tell you something when I stayed in the guest room. <laughs> Warren, it's too, I know it's too loud. The drink fridge is too loud. I know it is. I know it is. Um, I know it is. Doesn't it seem like mental health issues are overdiagnosed? I don't think so. But when we're looking at criminal court, again, I want people's brains to be explained to them because I think all of our brains work different. But when we're seeing them in court, the um the defense will definitely bring these things up is there an overlap between mental health issues and criminality yes yes there is and we we will that is something we can talk about more but there is an overlap there um a lot of mental health features of impulsivity control can make that overlap more uh more pronounced but this is why this comes up in criminal cases more um, if you are, if, if so that, that is why, that is why ADHD brains struggle to ignore certain sounds. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Yes. The mind does. Um, 
let's see somebody brought up that i was looking for or i was looking for a time to tell a story about a juror i i think now is a good a good time um oh oh lex luther this is a fantastic point and then i'll tell my story um okay she threw a chair at her and said on a scale from one to ten she was a double oh seven i think that's what i got out of this when she was asked about her mood scale that makes thank you lex luther when she was asked about her mood scale on a on one to ten she said she was a double oh seven so it's like how are you doing today and her response was um homicidal is how i'm doing today murderous i'm feeling murderous i am feeling murderous rage today that makes so much more sense on a scale of one to ten how are you feeling double oh seven that's actually kind of funny um and the doctor did not get the joke in that context that makes a lot more sense um that it was this i was having a very hard time a very hard time dealing with this the the pattern of this witness's testimony the emphasis put on certain words it was just very hard uh, very hard to follow this um what we know about this defendant is she has a bipolar diagnosis with um psychosis the doctor keeps bringing up schizophrenia but i don't think there is a schizophrenic diagnosis this um this defendant has had lots and lots of evaluations i'm interested to see what the um what the other experts have to say as well context is everything thank you it was just how are you today? Who are you today? How are you today? 007. I, on a scale of zero to 10, I can understand why that would be a kind of cheeky response, actually. Um, I don't think that's a bizarre response. I think it's just a joke that, um, that the psychiatrist doesn't get. It's, it's a, it's a dark joke in the context of the entire, um, in the entire situation, but it doesn't make it less funny. Also, the doctor saying that she said, um inappropriate made inappropriately sexual comments in high school i was a teen and have a teen doctor i have some questions um about about that because uh i have some questions about that okay not to derail the chat but taylor swift is in town this weekend and the traffic here in the bay is wild af i almost died this morning on my way to work because merch opens today be safe it's very interesting um it's very interesting to um, see the merch opening early. So uh, how are you feeling? I mean, I think a lot of people can describe some days. How are you feeling? It's like, I think people can relate to that. Um, the doctor is very Wisconsin in her phrasing. I mean, uh, okay. It was, uh, it was, it was difficult. It was difficult for some of you were asking about um the hallucinations those are things that can absolutely play in to uh ngi the doc's own personality is too blah to come up with the creativeness of 007 that's fair um rumor is taylor swift will be playing glastonbury next year okay i have no idea i know there is a whole concert coming up but since court's going to be back soon we need to get to this story did someone tell you you were an incredible woman a juror look jurors are advised this was at a period in time where this courthouse was in a battle over the back hallways and look these things go on at offices people fight over using the refrigerator and who can and can't people fight over uh, yeah, bottle bottled water brought into the office courthouses have these types of battles and this particular courthouse was going through a war over the back hallways and the judges did not want the attorneys using the back hallways the attorneys were saying that the back hallways particularly when in trial keep uh keep you from having negative interactions or interactions at all with the jurors they keep you from um potentially having interactions with defendants or victims family in front of the jurors it cuts down on a lot of problems if the attorneys can just use the back hallways and that had been the policy there was a new site judge the new site judge didn't want the attorneys in the back hallways it may or may not have something to do with somebody spilling something in the elevator i'm teasing that is a joke at a friend of mine who did drop something in the elevators the judges were pissed 
So we're waiting outside the courtroom for the jurors to come in. All the jurors are standing out there because the judge said be back at this time. The lawyers are standing out there. We're all just standing there waiting to go in. But you can't talk to each other. You're not allowed to talk to anybody. So we're all doing that. And one of the jurors came up to me and started telling me that they thought that I was an incredible woman, that I was beautiful, that they, it, amongst other things. And I'm like, sir, I cannot talk to you. Like, I shouldn't have even said, sir, I cannot talk to you. But I had to say, sir, I cannot talk to you. You cannot talk to me. And we had to have an entire ass hearing about it where the juror was brought in and the defense attorney got to ask some questions and the judge got to ask some questions and the judge and the defense attorney thought that this was fucking hilarious that this juror in the middle of trial was trying to ask me out um and they thought it was delightful the juror of course was excused the rest of the jurors were admonished that they're not allowed to talk to the attorneys i mean i've had jurors ask things like where did you get that water bottle or cup or whatever and you're just like your honor can you please remind the jurors that i cannot speak to them they cannot speak to you not about the trial not about anything they cannot say hello goodbye review or any of it educational Damn records it. for taylor shabizas did you make any conclusions about um we're back this court's really punctual a, a budding personality disorder oh no, no we got I opinions no okay. you didn't make an opinion about that did you see in the ma'am he said in opening statements that you had records that she was a, a really disturbed teen yes that was my impression and did you indicate that you felt that it even went beyond that yes which was later confirmed when we later received the bellin inpatient records from when she was 12 and then again at 14 and was diagnosed with a thought disturbance bipolar one depression severe with psychosis by by age 14. Um, did you have a chance to review? They are going to need to talk more uh, about the psychosis evaluation, Dr. Tracy Lucetta. Yes. Is, is she a, a PhD? She is a PhD. And she reviewed or uh, examined Taylor Shabizas in the past, correct? Yes. But these she are all leading questions. To her uh, report, correct? I'm not yes. mad at it. We all just did need to get through it. Did you also review Dr. Matthew? Seibold's it is what it is, report. and it's background. It's yes. just it is what it and is. He's a, a forensic psychologist from the Wisconsin uh, forensic unit, correct? Yes. And then did you also have the opportunity to review Dr. Christina Engine's report? Yes. And these are reports that were uh, conducted based off the evaluation. direct examination. Of it business, correct? feels yes. like cross-examination because um, of the nature of the questions, but I'm not mad at it. Let's just, uh, let's just get to the point. I'm ask you about whether you agree with I'm their fine. opinions or not. I'm going to ask you about what is your opinion as it relates to your evaluation um, an assessment of Taylor Shabizas. My opinion is that she qualifies for the not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. Based on my opinions are that she is not responsible, was not responsible because of a mental disease. She wasn't responsible for the criminal conduct because at the time of the event Murder. she had the mental disease and it both affected she lacked substantial capacity to both she's reading appreciate the wrongfulness of her conduct at the time the homicide occurred but also she could not con conduct she couldn't conform she lacked volitional control. She couldn't conform her conduct to the requirements of law. She was lacking in her ability to control herself. The volitional control both was lacking. That's my opinion. You, you said that she lacked the ability to control herself? Yes, at the time of the event. And do you opine that she has uh, a mental disease or a mental defect or both yes they are conforming both? these opinions to it's the way the law unclear. is clear um i tried to it's get unclear her to be evaluated mm -hmm. i suggested she be evaluated ma'am um as dr luchetta did too further for possible 
defect, mental defect, uh, brain issues. Um, that didn't happen, but my impression was that she has a mental disease, which is the bipolar, most likely bipolar. Most likely, ma'am. Ma'am, a diagnosed mental Based disease on your or defect. training and experience can doesn't chemicals, fit um, with I don't know, and it's not clear. They can, yes. Did you? draw any conclusions on whether you had one job ma'am taylor shabizas has any kind of chronic brain damage i couldn't because that has to be done um for the first step is what we call neuropsychological testing by yes. us yes. neuropsychologists where is the neuropsych pretty elaborate testing yes That's the process um, and then if those test results are abnormal then the next step would be a referral to a neurologist and medical doctor who would assess her and then decide whether or not there was enough information from the testing uh, to and the explore the possibility is of where? some brain defect, brain damage, maybe, yeah. Okay. Maybe it's um, not helpful In your here. report, uh, your opinions are on the last page, is that fair? Yes. And did you talk about her presentation when she presents herself? Do you have comments about that? Yes, it's my comments about that are that it's very, um, a very, very unusual, what we call presentation. How is she looking? How does she talk? How does she interact? Everything, what's going on in her mind, whatnot. And it's, it's, Really, really unusual. Her and presentation? I search my own 32 year memory bank here. If her presentation is um, very, very unusual, that, that might be called something it's else, though. Exceptionally unusual presentation. How she's coming across to me, the two attorneys, other evaluators it's in the school. Would you uh, agree that she face has a strange every, presentation? The judge does. Face is everything. How about her facial expressions? Can you give some commentary on that from what you've seen? Very unusual. They often, she's been described as smirky. I, yeah, yeah, smirky. The, cha the chat has described uh, She her has smirky. inappropriate, the, her, you know, grinning, weird grinning when she's talking about the crimes. Ma'am. Looking, people have interpreted it to be like laughing at what she did. At times, in the jail, with evaluators, with me, at times, briefly, it's very strange. Other times, looking, eh, you know, real, I mean, I can mimic it, very um, scowly. A lot of people interpret it superficially to be grinning. Yeah. Yeah, greening it all, my, getting my a kick out of everything. Nah, uh-uh, nah, uh-uh, not me, uh-uh. Based on my experience and training, that's a psychotic person right there. That's then. That, that's what's causing this really weird, bizarre. And I, I'm telling you, to me, it's off the scale. Thirty-two years. What scale, ma'am? I've seen a lot of what psychotic scale? people. Bipolar, psychotic, manic, and I just haven't seen and she very presents many like this. Differently that than all very of them. Exceptional, very exceptional. Do you believe this that she has a genuine mental wild. disorder? Yes. Of a psychotic nature? Yes. What is what is the nature? The best you know, my best opinion is the bipolar one with sometimes with psychosis, sometimes not. But that after we got the Bellin records from two inpatient admissions at age 12 and 14, or 14 and 16, for, let me just double what, check, yeah, 14 and 16, she was diagnosed at 14 with bipolar, 
depression, severe with psychosis. So that confirmed Is that that's what the we're I was with? thinking about schizophrenia and sometimes schiz schizophrenia. Is there a diagnosis of that though, ma'am? You're talking sometimes to a not. jury. Sometimes really hard to, to tell bipolar from schizophrenia. And there's a kind of a combined one called schizoaffective disorder. Is she and diagnosed that, with that? That's applied to her too, but I think based on this history we have from Bellin when she was diagnosed with bipolar um, and then again at Nicolay when she was 22 years old also bipolar uh, yeah I, my opinion is based on my experience and training is bipolar based on two one based on two the more hours. serious there's bipolar one bipolar two but bipolar one can have psychosis psychotic psychotic this witness's expert testimony is to point at the defendant and say that person is psychotic. What, 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 it, what is happening? Ma'am, there needs to be testing to back it up and there may be, she has a psychiatric history back to when she was a child. But where is the testing to just back it up? Ma'am. Episode, so that's my opinion. Are your um, opinions to a reasonable degree of professional certainty or psychological certainty? I don't certainty? know. Yes. Both, correct? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, you did prepare a report on all of these uh, findings, correct? Yes. Could I approach your honor? <clears throat> uh, okay. The, the, uh, the cross-examination is going to be interesting. That is my report, July 3rd, 2023. This um, is something. Does that report contain all of your findings? I don't know if it's doing uh, this defendant a service because uh, this Taylor defendant Schmitz's. has a psychiatric it's record, Dr. 14. Summary. She yes. deserves somebody to diagnose her properly. <clears throat> Everything in there is accurate, correct? Um, I, I hope so. Yes, I think so. Okay. I hope so. I, I hope so. Ma'am, ma you are not giving us confidence because you keep saying that you are kind of taking a guess at what's going on with this defendant. The judge's face. Your Honor, I agree with that face. I hope and so. And the report is dated uh, July 3rd I of 2023, so. correct? Yes. Offer it was exhibit just, six. It was just from a few weeks ago. I sure yeah, hope it's. No, I sure, six is received. I sure hope it's um, accurate. Doctor, you did review Dr. Matthew Seiple's report, correct? I, I was did. trying to two, pull up the bombastic reports. side eye in the chat. Read I'm with you. Yes. Yeah, that's not a degree um, of professional of certainty. That's a and findings that he rendered. Maybe. Correct? Yes. Do you agree or disagree? Disagree. Tell me why. This defense attorney looks like he is. Uh, in pain. I, contrary to how Dr. Seipel, she um, looked, this he, defense attorney is his trying opinion, his which best. I respect. I respect all professionals' opinions. I we're don't criticize the professional. I, we're, tr I can we're trying with you, ma'am. Support my own opinion, but in contrast, um, he. I believe that she has. My opinion is that she has a a, a genuine mental disorder. And then, Dr. Christina Engine, did you review her evaluation? Yes. And you agree or disagree with hers? Disagree. Tell me why. Chad, I love um, you so much. You're you're keeping similar me to Dr. Seipel. If I if I remember her report well enough. <clears throat> I disagree. It's My opinion job. is that Ms. Shabusiness has a genuine mental disorder of a psychotic nature. Okay, I have no other questions. Thank you. He's like, please, please get me uh, out of good here. Good morning, doctor. Hi. Oh, Sorry. boy. No, well, no, uh, Taz. Hidden here behind the court for us. I'll try to move over. Uh, uh, can you hear me okay? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so you uh, you testified you're an independent forensic psychologist, is that right? That's right. And does that mean that you're just uh, sort of a solo practitioner, you're not employed with a larger facility? Right. I, I don't work for anybody. I work for myself. Uh, How's and that you've going? been uh, retained by the defense in this case? Yes. All right. Um, so is there a retainer agreement in place? No. Most... M what was there so the, vast, the very vast majority of my cases were for the public defender. So they... They have an appointment letter, how uh, much they think they're going to pay. Appointment letter, not, not, not No money retainer. up front until the case is done and they bill. I understand. Or he bills. Sure. Um, but you are being obviously compensated for your testimony. 
No, I haven't been paid anything. No, I've been on this case, what, since 20, I don't, I, I don't get paid till the case is all done. Okay, but at the end of the case you will. Right. Okay. Um, you were asked questions about having previously conducted NGI evaluations in the past. Right. Um, how many? Hundreds? I, I don't Hundreds? know. Maybe, you know, a lot. A lot. All right. And uh, how many in the last 10 years? Many. And I have several right now. So many. Okay. So like dozens? Oh, uh, yes, at least. Yes. Right. And uh, your CV, do you still have that in front of you? I believe it's exhibit uh, one. Are you always hired by the defense, ma'am? I have questions. Uh, uh, you outlined some um, on page two um, publications and presentations that you've completed. Is that right? Yes. And can we see the prosecutor too, please? For instance, in 2022, you, you had a, a publication or presentation on sexually violent persons. Yes. And similarly, in 2001, an, another publication on sexually violent persons. Those, those were pre presentations, yes. Okay. And would it be fair to say, I mean, looking through 2009 at least, all the publications and presentations we're seeing are with respect to sexually violent persons cases? Uh, most okay. are, yes. And do you have publications or have you presented on the topic of conducting NGI evaluations? Uh, no. Uh, other than uh, 2018, a colleague, a young colleague and I uh, you. did a fill-in at the Wisconsin Psychological Association just on starting a forensic practice. And, you know, we talked about the different kinds of, you know, like, that's it was very much appreciated. Psychologists who were thinking. We need to see the prosecutor's face as he asks these questions. Probably mention NGIs. Okay. But that wasn't like a presentation on how to do NGI evaluations. No. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. um, I would then want to ask about some of your sources of information, and, and counsel went through some of those with you. Um, with respect to uh, what occurred on February 22nd, 2022, Just, uh, what sort of information did you review? The criminal complaint. You said what? What information did I ah. did I review regarding Tracy? That? What yes. we saw was Event. the public okay. sitting behind yeah, the prosecutor. Nobody was there. No, um, wait. Parents were upstairs. We don't want to see him anymore. Uh, Back so to the we prosecutor. don't have any direct witnesses. But I reviewed the police reports, all the their interviews. Um, that you know, that's basically it. What she told other evaluators in what she told me very briefly. So that, that was it. So it was, uh, when you say police reports, you're referring to like the paper report that a detective or officer wrote? Right, there's the criminal complaint or information, which is a couple pages long, but then attached usually with it, usually are the basis for the criminal charges. And you know, with the police, the, the, I guess in this case, the police, who went there, uh, arrested her, their interviews with her. So, so did you, you know just review the criminal complaint or also all of the police reports? Members? All the police reports. Okay. Um, so then you, it sounds like you, you didn't review the recorded interview itself of Mission oh, Business. Transcript, the recorded interview herself and the at least an hour and a half, two hours of the video. The judge is trying to swallow interview. a yawn. So, so you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you review the recorded interview of Misha Business from February 23rd of 2022? Uh, what I was given uh, by the attorney was a transcript of their interviews. Did you watch it? And so a transcript, written tran type. Okay. We a know transcript. what a transcript is. Like Did a, you watch like the police report summarizing it? it? Uh, if I remember right, it was a transcript of the, you know, a, I don't know if they had a court reporter in there. I don't know how they do that. But um, not, not the actual visual image itself. You didn't I only it. saw about an hour and a half, two hours of the visual. So um, you did watch it. Visual, whatever you call it. Sure. Video. Video. In, the, in those conference rooms where the police detectives were interviewing Ms. Shabiznes. Okay. Um, so you reviewed an hour and a half of that. So Was you that the watched February it. February 23rd interview? Uh, yes, I believe so. And so you didn't review the rest of the approximate five and a half hours of that interview? No, they, it didn't transmit to me by computer for some reason. Okay. So it was only roughly an hour and a half. You didn't think it was important to watch her interview with law enforcement? See. 
the, You're determining the, if she was psychotic at the time the she committed a crime. That, the whole that wasn't important. They tried, important? but for whatever reason, the I don't know technology between the DAs or what that's happened before. Not well, uncommon, sure. <laughs> ma'am. Well, I, you know, we aren't providing you any information to review, right? What pardon? We, uh, the state isn't providing you any information to review, right? You're getting that information from other people. Well, I think it goes from you all to him. Sure. Yeah, right. And then to okay. me. Yeah. Um, so then it also sounds like, uh, Doctor, uh, you haven't reviewed the February 28th interview of Misha Business. I read the the police descriptions of it, and I thought I had a transcript. You know, I, I think it was a summary, a, you know, pretty decent summary of the February 28th. Similar, the summary. Pretty decent detailed of the it's too early for me to be this the two over interviews it. they did on that day. Okay. Um, but not again the actual like Mission visual Business image is gonna look at the jury and be like, Do you not understand why I threw a chair at her? Do you, if there was you, if it was sent to me, do you get it? Couldn't Ma'am. Okay. Um, You're evaluating you uh, mentioned then obviously one of your sources her of behavior at the time of the your, crime, you didn't watch uh, the whole meeting, interview. Or meetings with Misha Business. Yes. All right. Oh my god. Okay. June, scratch that, the February 7th, 2023 interview, that was the instance where Misha Business uh, threw a chair at you, right? This yes. has um, uh, been illuminating. That, you said she just sat down. Yeah. Uh, and, and was calm after that point? Very. And I, I looked she at probably her. felt better. As a subject to doing, uh, you know, I used that time before the, the guards came in, maybe it took a while, three minutes or so. And it was, it was weird, bizarre, whatever you want to call it, because she immediately, very calmly, uh, came back, sat down across from me, and I looked at her physiological responses, just totally blank. And again, I've seen violent patients. I got attacked once and beat up at Mendota, got slapped. She said no one's ever thrown a chair at her and now is talking about being physically attacked by other patients. Though she was like, this, this, I've never seen anything like this chair. You're, you're outlining being physically assaulted. And maybe the fact that this defendant had no physiological response is not because she's psychotic, but because she was like, maybe if I throw a chair, it'll work. Maybe, maybe it's because it wasn't based on anything physiological that was happening and it was a decision, perhaps. Uh, but I, I saw very many aggressions on the unit I was on at Mendota for the 14 most aggressive patients, males in the whole state. And I, we'd have between three to seven aggressions. And usually after a person does something like that, they have a red face, angry, yelling, swearing. Because they're in it. Breathing heavily, so, nothing, nothing. So, um, you know, those prior instances you talked about, those were with people who were- Actually psychotic. Uh, at Mendota, you said? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So those were people who were actually found to have a mental illness. Uh, no, not all of them. We had, we we were the un overflow, you know, we mostly had our patients were um, from around the state, um, jails, prisons, Winnebago mental health. They were either, most yes. of them were, had been found not guilty. She is saying that when most people act out violently, there is an entire system-wide physiological response. So when they are angry, their whole body is angry and then they act out and they look like they're angry. They're saying with her, it was nothing. Maybe because she just chose to pick up a chair and throw it at you and she was not acting out of any physiological need because she wasn't that mad. She was just like, mm. I, I think we're, um, okay, we're just, okay, we're just gonna keep. You know, legally insane, but we were the overflow unit for the admission unit for competency evaluation. So they. They were not all necessarily mentally ill, but most were of, with a psychotic illness. And those were the people who kind of you made a gesture, like a red face. Yeah, like but that after. I've dealt with many aggressive people in the outpatient setting too. Um, and yeah, it, it was unusual. I just don't. Her presentation my memory banks, was not. I had a hard time coming up with somebody. You know, I, I've seen it before. Have you seen people but who are malingering? But it's unusual for a person to not be aroused 
you know, when they're, when they're feeling so angry, it was unusual. Have you considered that it's because maybe she wasn't feeling that way and just wanted to throw a chair at you? Maybe that it's an unusual presentation. Maybe there's a reason it's an unusual presentation for you. Uh, what else have you considered? And then I want to ask uh, about the June 19th, 2023 interview. I cannot. Uh, with Ms. Shabusiness. Um, and that was at the... Uh, uh, a conference room area? Yes. And her attorney was present for that, right? Yes. And is it common for you to have those sort of evaluations with an interested party in the room? I always ask attorneys, going back to when I was at Mendota, I learned this at Mendota, I always ask attorneys if they have the time to sit in at least during the initial part, like for a competency evaluation, so I can see the attorney and the client interacting and so I can it gives me more information about whether the the defendant is understanding what's going on if they're able to uh, work with their attorney so I always ask attorneys to do that you know sometimes they do sometimes they don't have time whatever uh, it was unusual though in this case that Mr. I have, a, um, I have suspicions about that. The defense attorney sat in through the whole thing. I did it for a particular reason, though. Okay. Um, because she had thrown a chair uh, at you. You talked about uh, exhibit number four. Do you still have that in front of you, Doctor? It's the chart you prepared. Oh, sure. Yeah, great. <sighs> okay. Right, there's a, a number of exhibits here. <laughs> um, so. You kind of listed the age of Misha Business at the time of various admissions. Is that right? Right, approximate age. So it looks like uh, ages uh, 14, there was a Bellin Health Psychiatric Center. Uh, yes. Age 16 from Bellin Health Psychiatric. Yes. And then there was nothing that was reviewed until Misha Business uh, was 23. Right. So you reviewed no mental health history, and you're aware of no mental health history from ages 16 through 23. Well, 2020, she was in the jail, or no, I guess that was 2020, 20, when she was 22. So, okay. yeah, no, there's a gap. Okay. Yeah. So there wasn't anything, I guess, from 16 to 22 then? Not that I know of. That's not um, how that presented earlier. Kind of summarizing um, the, the, the chart in Exhibit 4, I, I noticed a few times that when you're describing hallucinations, there was also sometimes then concurrently reports of methamphetamine use. Is that fair? Yes. And in your experience, methamphetamine can produce psychosis as a side effect. Yes, it can in certain, in some cases. And that was actually reported in quite a few of these records, wasn't it? It was. All right. So then I want to ask about the Bellin uh, stay in 2012. You reviewed those records. Chat, right? you guys are, yes. I, I love the conversation you're having. This and, is a, and, Particular, this witness is uh, interesting. Summary. Yes. And I guess the discharge summary, that's kind of like the exit interview, yep. so to speak. Right? Exactly. All right. Um, so you would uh, recognize that if you were to see it? Maybe. <laughs> but I have it on the chart. I believe that the discharge, she was diagnosed with mood disorder, not otherwise specified, without psychosis by, by the three yeah. days. Oh, it's me. That's, that's me just, doing it. Exactly right. I'm going to show you Exhibit 7. Does that appear to be the discharge summary you're talking about? Yes. And in discharge diagnoses, you mentioned a mood disorder without psychosis. Yes. Um, nowhere in the discharge diagnosis is there a bipolar diagnosis, is there? Yes, that's true. If she was out of and state, they fact, still should have her record. Flip to the, to the last page of that. And if not, the defense needs um, to make it, it clear. But if there's a gap, on the bottom, they should have the her last page of that staple packet. Doctor. They have her school records um, from out of did state. Did you see the portion that says condition on discharge? Yes. Okay, and it says, quote, on exam, Taylor denied hallucinations or thoughts of harm toward herself or others, a wish to be dead, or that she would be better off dead. Did I state that accurately? Yes. And that was the Bellin Health Records from 2012. Yes. Um, I then, I then want to ask about the Bellin Health Records from 2014. Uh, you reviewed those as well? Yes. And she said she reviewed all of her records, though, from 
there was a, a portion elementary that, through the end of high school uh, contained the the discharge uh, notes as well. Is that right? Uh, yes. All right. I'm going to show you Exhibit 8, Doctor. Uh, do you recognize that? Yes. Does that appear to be some, uh, some of the discharge notes from October 29th, 2014? This was difficult. Uh, that wasn't the question. You see at the top and all through here, pretty weird, um, because it's got it, every page at the top says 10-28-2014. Admission. And May then Ma'am, in your professional opinion, what can you please define weird better for us? We're in a, a murder trial. This was weird is is not get it's it's not helping. Parentheses discharged from assess at Bellin. So it, it's confusing. Oh, I it was, enough, we can speed one up. more confusing medical. I've been reviewing medical records since I was age 14 as a candy striper. And this one, this was hard. So it was, it was it's difficult to figure out. Is this the final discharge? And I think I finally concluded that she was only there for three days. So I think it's the discharge, but it's the discharge summary, but it is confusing. You have to look at all the dates and everything, but this was really confusing. Sure. Um, but if you could, uh, doctor, flip to the last page of that exhibit. You have to look at the dates um, and everything. This is just really confusing, counsel. The diagnosis for yes. Misha Business. And there's two diagnoses, aren't there? Right. One of which is cannabis abuse, comma, continuous. Right. The other is alcohol abuse, comma, episodic. Yes. Okay, there's not a bipolar diagnosis listed there, is there? No, there's not. And there's not that prior mood disorder that we heard about in 2012, is there? Somewhere in these pages, I believe, I that... And I'm sorry, doctor, for the question. Okay. Clear in the diagnosis part, neither of those diagnoses <laughs> are listed, are they? Exactly. No bipolar, and what, what else was the other thing you said? Mood uh, disorder. Mood disorder. Yes, you're right. And that was the Bellin from 2012, right? Yes, age 16. I don't think Candy Striper should be reading people's medical records, but I don't. These, um, <laughs> she's been reading medical records, records since she was 14. I don't know. Nicolay, uh, I don't know. And that's sort of the, the, the county save this uh, for later. Uh, admission, right, to, to lock facility? Yes. Okay. And, and actually, the St. Mary's uh, hospital visit you uh, testified to on direct, that was like the day before the admission to the Nicolay Center, right? I think it was the day of. Okay. I think that it looks like because it's three March 22nd, 2021. I think they. St. Mary's ER discharged your right to Nicolet. That's, right. That's, I think that's how that went down. Okay. So when uh, Misha Business was uh, admitted into uh, Nicolet, uh, she uh, had a drug screen done, did she not? Yes. And that drug screen was positive for controlled substance, was it not? I, I believe so. I, did, I don't have it written down here, but I, well, substance use, yes. And then by then, um, I, my memory is that it was meth, I think, meth, probably THC. Marijuana probably is not helpful, ma'am. Can you can you just testify to the things you remember and not just be like it probably was this too? That would be that would be super helpful to all of us if you would just stick to the f the facts. I also didn't have candy striper on my bingo card at all, at all. Um, I also didn't have the um, pointing at the defendant and saying that woman's psychotic with no further testing. I didn't. Um, have that on my bingo card either. So, well, uh, we are almost done with this case. So I, this is, this is me covering it as much as I'm going to cover it. She, the defendant, she business was convicted yesterday. We're in the NGI penalty phase of the trial. So I'm going to be, I think we should be done today, but, but, uh, I don't know. It depends on how long the prosecution's doctors take, but I'm covering it till we get to the NGI verdict for sure. Cause now I'm invested. All right, let's get to some questions. While we're here, this is something. Doctor, doctor um, um, you had reviewed those records from uh, Nicolay Psychiatric, right? She's not yes. getting paid until the end. That's what she says. Yes. All right. So I'm going to show you exhibit nine. How did he do? Test your memory. I know you reviewed a lot of records. So does that appear to be the uh, notes from uh, Mr. Business's admission? Yeah, Mr. Business does not seem yes. to love this. And that's dated uh, March twenty second of 2021. Uh, did you say 27? 
It's 23rd. No, March 20. Uh, or, you're correct. The admission date is March 22nd. Yes. Okay. And the date of service that's listed here is March 23rd. Right. Um, and then in the history of present illness, the notes it states in the second hard line, for me. she has been using methamphetamine. She would not tell me how often and how much she has been using it, but drug screen was positive for methamphetamine, amphetamine, and THC. Did I state that accurately? Yes. All right. And then um, Nicolay uh, Psychiatric, that's a uh, sort of lock facility, right? That's uh, my understanding is it is. I don't think I've ever been there, but my understanding is it's probably locked, I would guess. Yeah, it's a facility that's sort of closely monitored. And, yes, you know, I, I think they do. I think I did read that it, it, they you know lock their units, I believe. I guess the purpose of all that staff presumably is to, to watch after patients. Well, right, because she was there on a, a mental health commitment, so she either had to have been dangerous to herself or to somebody else. And, those are usually locked units. So presumably, you know, people who are in that facility aren't, you know, using controlled substances anymore. Uh, usually. Usually. Um, so then I'm going to show you exhibit number 10. Does that appear to be the discharge notes from Nicolay Psychiatric? Yes, this one we know because it says final summary on the top. <laughs> uh, and that date is uh, April 12th of 2021. So this one is not yes. as confusing, I guess. And there still is for the discharge diagnosis, as you mentioned, a bipolar diagnosis, right? Yes. Um, can you flip to the second page? Um, on condition on discharge, um, it states the patient has a bright affect. Is that right? Yes. That she is forward looking. Yes. That she showed some motivation regarding remaining clean and sober. Yes. That she denies any uh, delusional beliefs. Yes. That uh, she, uh, I guess it notes, there's still some degree of paranoia is present, but denies any thoughts of self-harm. Yes. And that was after being in that facility for that time. And she was just started on, she was on that was a yes or no uh, question. oral antipsychotic, but she just was started on the injected medicine, the longer acting. Um, I understand you want to fill in the gaps there, but what he's getting at atypical antipsychotic medication is that when she's not on meth, she, she was doing better. Her. That's after the, after what he was saying. Six month order to treat she. But also on April 12th, she presumably would have been free from methamphetamine, amphetamine, and THC. That is what he is from the at. So 21 days. You know, usually in general, she it would have been out of her system, ma'am. But do you think she has access to methamphetamine and the locked commitment? Is that what you're insinuating? I have a fuck ton of questions. Still possibly affecting her thought processes that's just you just don't know because the, the testing wasn't done sure. but no they, but totally yeah she she still had some paranoia it says some degree of paranoia was still there however she wasn't um no no delusional beliefs she's trying to argue with the um, prosecutor so before he asked the question super psychotic which is what wasn't psychotic she wasn't and actually i glossed over psychotic? two discharge diagnoses one was the bipolar right yes well, there was a second one wasn't there yes there substance super use psychotic in the disorder i.e in other words THC, marijuana, and methamphetamine. Thank you. Um, you. You talked then about some of these um, hallucinations that are scattered throughout the records you reviewed, right? Yes. And some of those are things that the defendant is endorsing. Isn't that fair? Yes. And what does endorsing mean? Um, she's saying self-report. She's reporting them herself. She's describing some of them herself. Not a lot over her history. You, are you talking about the hallucinations? Just just the concept of what endorsing means. And I, yeah, I that's, that's, say, yeah, just something saying. that's reported by a person. Do you have a headache? And if you say yes, that you're endorsing the headache. I have a headache. Um, and, and actually, I was fine when we started. The, um, I now have a headache. Bipolar diagnosis at Nicolay Psychiatric. You mentioned that you reviewed a report authored by Dr. Lucetta. Is that right? Yes. And Dr. Lucetta was a uh, expert retained by the defense earlier in the case. Yes. And she prepared a report that you reviewed. Yes. And part of that report, uh, Ms. Lu or sorry, Dr. Lucetta spoke. Thank you for this cross-examination. Yes. Just... And do you recall a portion where they were discussing that bipolar diagnosis? I don't remember that exactly. Would it, would it I'd have to look to, at it. Would it, would it refresh your sure. recollection if I showed you the report, which is happening? The cross-examination was moving right along so well. And then it was, here, I'm gonna speed I'm this gonna up a little bit. No. Cause she's gonna have to review this. I believe so. Can you review that report? Yes. Doctor, if you could turn to page three of that report. The prosecution is just like, can you? We're walking through to the final the questions, full paragraph. which is she's not been diagnosed with the things that you're 
sort of the last sentence of that. Speculating um, about. And, and it says, quote, she, and that refers to Mr. Business, questioned the bipolar diagnosis, hypothesizing that her symptoms were attributable to methamphetamine abuse, explaining that prior to admission, she had been administering the drug intravenously up to nine times per day for five to eight months prior to her. What? Did I read that right? Yes. And that's referencing the uh, Nicolay records that we just talked about, right? Uh, yes. And that's where the bipolar diagnosis come, came from. Just a, sec just a second here. This is what the this she is what the prosecution is getting at. When it, the right beginning it says Miss Business reported that she was previously admitted, blah 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 blah, and it seems like she, that's what she's telling to Doctor Lucetta. Um, but then at the point where you're blah the blah blah sentence, blah, blah. She questioned the bipolar blah blah blah. That's, what is you know, happening? I, I remember reading this, and I again I couldn't quite figure it out. I think you're right that when she's questioning. I remember reading this, but I couldn't quite figure it out. Here, let me just lay it out for you the way the prosecutor just laid it out. The defendant said she questions whether or not she's bipolar because leading up to that commitment, she was doing a fuck ton of meth for months on end. That's what that report says, ma'am. Blah, blah, blah. And she questioned the bipolar diagnosis attributed <laughs> to methamphetamine abuse. I think Dr. Lucetta is taking that, that Misha Business, that's what she told Nick Lay, the psychi psychiatric staff there, I think. that Your interpretation is that sentence refers to what Misha Business told Nick Lay? Well, she, okay, Misha Business told Dr. Lucetta at the beginning of the paragraph that she was admitted to Nick Lay. Okay, so that's her self-report. She was vague about why admitted, bipolar, she was diagnosed with bipolar. She was discharged. She discontinued the medication. She, she questioned like that medication. diagnosis. She questioned the bipolar diagnosis. So I'm not sure if that reflects when she was at Nick Lay or what she's telling Dr. Lucetta. Let's, I'll go, and you think it was Dr. Lucetta. So that's okay because she does, she's done that. Uh, sometimes she will say, this is Ms. Shabusiness, yeah, I've been diagnosed with bipolar. Other times she will say, I don't think I've got it. I don't like taking medications. It, it varies. It does vary. So... Well, let's just agree that this is what she's telling Dr. Lucetta, but it's a little sure. hazy there. And I guess the point, Doctor, in any event, the, the sentence Did I you read say it's hazy? Those are the statements of Misha Business regarding the bipolar diagnosis. Right, regardless if she's telling Dr. Lucetta or the treaters. I'm still at stuck on the blah, she blah, blah. I really Not am. Not unusual. Sure. I'm really stuck on the blah, blah, blah over the medical records. I just, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able and to then, move um, on from Dr. Doctor, blah, would blah, like blah. to talk just... a little bit more about bipolar one. Um, what is the diagnostic criteria for bipolar one? When a person has, um, by definition, they have to have had at least one, what's called a manic episode, which is extremely elevated mood. And it can be with psychosis, thought disorder or not, but they have to be, have at least one prior or current manic episode. Ms. Business it, also does like, appreciate the blah, blah, blah. She's like, things. I'm fucking over it's either, this. You Six. go from, depression really bad depression with bipolar one super duper suicidal type real depression and then they have to have it in their history at least one of these real super duper elevated moods and it's, it's bizarre when you see it it's, it's pretty bizarre yeah so that's so, basically it so so you need at least one manic episode yes i believe that that's in the diagnostic and in order to diagnose a manic episode there are four criteria aren't there uh, you know, we look at the, the mood, a very elevated, exceptionally elevated mood. It's a yes and then or no some question, ma'am. Usually there's these other behaviors that go along with it. Again, it can be, the person can be psychotic. It's bizarre what the DSM says. But they can be psychotic in this very elevated mood. Help and me. And then there usually are some other behaviors. What they are those? They can stay up for three, four days. They can be, they wildly spend, sometimes gamble away, hypersexual. So um, energy you, feeling. He asked you about energetic. the DSM criteria. So, so there are four criteria, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I don't have my DSM book in front of me, but uh, so the uh, ma'am, the DSM five that you referenced. What is that? That's the the American Psychiatric MD Psychiatric Association Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Blah blah blah. Fifth edition. Oh, Psych I think psychiatry is hard. Fifteen, I think it was put out, in, and it's used in this country. 
for mental health diagnoses and billing. You would agree it's a pretty commonly <laughs> used and widely accepted. Uh, in the United of, States, yes. And uh, billing. So for, are are uh, we not in diagnosis. the United States? Uh, the Have we slipped into a parallel a universe? Of abnormally and persistently elevated behavior. Is that fair? Yes. And that period has to last, quote, at least one week in present most of the day, nearly every day. Does that sound right? Yes. So it's not just a manic episode that, you know, is an hour, right? It's, it's a long period of time that's yeah. manic. Right. In, in a heightened state. She's, she said super duper. Yes. yes. Um, and then the second criteria is some of those, you know, symptoms, mood disturbances. You, you mentioned gambling, things like the that. The prosecutor might have a DSM yes. on his desk. And that mood disturbance, the third criteria, also has to cause a, an impairment of some kind, right? A what? An impairment of some kind? Yes, an impairment, yes. And then the fourth criteria for a bipolar one diagnosis is that the manic episode is not attribut attributable to the physiological effects of a substance. It, yes. I.e. a drug. I.e. Yes. meth. Such as methamphetamine. Exactly. So... Or LSD. Sure. No, we're just asking so if you're about the meth a manic in this episode, one. But you have information that there was recent methamphetamine use. That would be a concern for a bipolar one diagnosis. Yes, without further information or more observations. Um, doctor, I then want to ask some questions about uh, your report. I believe it's exhibit is it six. Is that still in front of you? She's yeah. like, I don't know. Okay. Is that exhibit six? It's weird. There's uh, a lot of shit up here. Yes. That's the most recent okay. exhibit. So um, your report um, and your opinions <laughs> that you're testifying to today regarding NGI, uh, rely in part based on your observations of Mr. Business on June 19th, right? Correct. Yes. And actually, as a result of that interview, based on your observations, you had a concern about her present competency in that moment, didn't you? Yes. And in fact, your report that you're referencing in Exhibit 6 is sort of a combination NGI report and competency. Yes, that's and, what I was asked to do. And those legally are different concepts, right? They are. Uh, competency is sort of in the moment. Yes. And, and NGI obviously re refers to the date of the offense. Exactly, the time of the offense. How yeah. is there so still coffee in the judge's your mug? Mission business, you had a concern about her competency. Has that been refilled? Yes. Objection yeah. relevance. Did I miss it? Yet you're using her statements to form your NGI opinion. Uh, her statements, my observations, but not just that two hour interview. It was the entire information I had about the case. But yes, you're right. During the interview, it helped Don't me to form my opinions stripers. because I, I submitted is, a mini report this months woman before is, uh, that where I, I couldn't make an opinion because I hadn't been able to interview her. That was well, both competency and NGI. Thank she you. has been staring directly um, at the camera. So then I, mean, it might I just be grabbing uh, her attention. want to ask about uh, malingering. Yes. Uh, what does that mean to you? Malingering is intentional faking. I was waiting for malingering to come up. Symptoms could be about anything, any symptoms. But in the psychiatric profession, malingering like when she is showed no other physiological of, response to just throwing a cherry like that. System, maybe you know, is that sort of a synonym for feigning or something like that? Yeah, that's a fan. Yeah, malingering, feigning. Yeah, faking. Do you I, use I it synonymously? It, faking. Sure. Intentional uh, faking. Uh, and Synonymous. you would agree that's been a concern for evaluators who have met with Misha Business. Yes. Um, Dr. Seipel had that concern, did he not? I think he concluded, if I'm not, if my memory's right, oh, I think he, he concluded con that's concluded it. Yes. she was malingering. I, I think you're right. Dr. Seipel concluded she was faking, right? It, yeah, I believe so. And it was a concern raised by Dr. Lucetta, was it not? It, yes, definitely. And, and, and again, she was a expert retained by the Yes, defendant. definitely. Yes. Uh, and that she suggested these potential for feigning uh, should be explored further. Exactly. And in fact... Impatient. Impatient. And in fact, uh, in your field, there are tools that can be used to help determine if somebody is accurately providing you information, right? Yes. One of those is the MMPI. Yes. Um, and those... Have you used those before? Oh yeah, and, and they're helpful for you. There's to the know MMPI if the is providing you accurate information. It's on my bingo card. I'm but overly excited about I'm this. Sorry. Yes, but but you what? have to take that 
But it's what? One part of the clinical evaluation, but you got to evaluate it with Ma other information Ma to decide if it's an accurate test result. Are sure. you questioning the MMPI, ma'am? But you need that information to then know if it's accurate, right? You, you need what information? You need to perform the test. You don't have to perform. I don't have to perform like a lot of fancy 500, 300. I don't have to do that. That's not a requirement. Psychiatrists don't do psychological testing. So sometimes I, I might I do it, I but I I've done I'm dead. I'm many dead. evaluations without that when I have enough <laughs> other information. No, I don't, you don't, you're not required. This is why Often I covered this. Says, today. You're a psychologist, you gotta do MMPI. Not, no, you don't have to do that. And, and but I, I've done it many times. And, and doctor, I, I, I wasn't suggesting that. What I was suggesting is you, you mentioned I that. Uh, I need to rewind. I can't believe that just happened. I don't need no fancy test. I just sit in trial and look at her and go, that woman's psychotic. Ma'am. I don't need diagnostics that control for malingering or not i don't need no stinking tests oh my god that's a fans yeah malingering feigning yeah faking i i simplify it faking the poor sure. defense Intention. attorney faking the poor defense attorney uh, and I, you would agree that's been oh a concern for god who have met with mission business yes um dr seipel had that concern. Okay. Did he not? I the think MMPI he controls for milling. Oh, we learned. My so, memory's right. I think he concluded that. We learned that, so that, much yes. about the MMPI I, I during right. Deputy Heard. She was faking, right? It, yeah, oh I believe god. so. Oh my and god. And it was a concern oh. raised by Dr. Lucetta, was it not? It, yes, definitely. And, and, and again, she was a and, expert retained by the defendant. Yes. Uh, and that she suggested these potential for feigning uh, should be explored further. Exactly. And in fact, impatient, impatient. And in fact, uh, in your field, there are tools that can be used to help determine if somebody is accurately providing you information, right? Yes. One of those is the MMPI. Yes. Um, and those, have you used those before? Oh yeah. And, and they're helpful for you. <laughs> she to rolled her eyes. The patient is providing you accurate information. But. I'm sorry. You, yes, but you have to take that it's one part of the clinical evaluation, but you got to evaluate it with other information to decide if it's an accurate test result. Sure. But you need that information to then know if it's accurate, right? You, you need what information? You need to perform the test. You don't have to perform. I don't have to perform like a lot of fancy <laughs> 500, 300, I don't have to do that. That's not a requirement. Psychiatrists don't do psychological testing. So sometimes I might do it, but I've done many evaluations without that when I have enough other information that I don't, you don't, you're not required. There's nothing that says you're a psychologist, you gotta do MMPI. There's no, that's, no, you don't have to do that. And, and but I, I've done it many times. And, and doctor, I, I, you've done it because it's an excellent that. test. What I was suggesting right? is you, you mentioned that uh, this is you not need real to life. Take that test into account and see if it's accurate, essentially. Right? If you've done the test, yes. sure. Or if somebody else, like in this case, it had been done by all these other people. Who? So I consider that information. Who did the MMPI? What other people did the MMPI? I don't need to do the MMPI. What? Who? What? And that they found that, yes, yeah, she had, you know, the other thing, she had over-presented, we call it the test. Malingering. Detects, can detect. When you're over-presenting a symptom, like, oh, my God, I really got a bad headache. Really, super, you know, like that. You over-present it. it. Basically, again, it could be faking, but it's just an exaggeration. The poor defense attorney's me. face. He's just like, sure. fuck. So uh, but in your report, again, Exhibit 6, I think you quote, psychological testing by other evaluators found signs of possible malingering Includes or intentional the MMPI. faking of mental disorder symptoms. Is that a fair summary of what you wrote in your report? Yes. All right. And at the end of your report, it says, quote, testing can reveal attempts to fake a mental disorder. 
end quote. Did Apparently the MMPI is real good at that, page, just from uh, what I understand. Report, doctor. That the that MMPI is real, real good at helping right. determine yes. that. That's... And so what attempts did you make to use some of those oh, tests damn it. to determine if Misha business was faking? Yeah, good question. I looked at good question, the other psychologist's test good results. Good question, I used none. Plus another evaluator done when about concerning her baby, um, Child Protective Services. I think he did testing too. So I looked at Did you just drop results. in that CPS had been yes, involved? Yes, they showed exactly what you're saying. Man, but you're hired I by the defense. Don't do that. In the context of the rest of the evaluation and my experience and training. So doctor, what you is did your not experience? conduct any of those tests with Mission Business on June 19th? Yes. Or is that no? Which way do I answer that sure. one? I uh, did not conduct any of those question. tests. Right, on whenever I... Even though yeah. those tests can be helpful to determine if a patient is providing you accurate information. Yes. And you didn't utilize any of those tests in this case. No. That's an answer to objection. <laughs> Counsel, it's not going to get better. You can object all you want. She didn't answer clearly. The prosecution has kind of a double negative. She didn't use any psychological testing criteria other than standing on this witness stand and pointing at this witness Thank and you, saying, Doctor. that I woman's psychotic. Right. Good God. Do you, do you want to take a break or should I ask some questions? I need a break. Okay. No, ask your um, questions, then we'll go to lunch. With regards to um, your report and evaluation of my client, this, did you get a sense that she was attorney. feigning or faking? At times with me, or not with me during our interview, I didn't, I didn't think that was, or my interview, I didn't think that was faking at all. Okay. No. Huh? But with other evaluators, and again, the test results, uh -huh. it, it, you know, it's, it's my my based on my education my training in this field my impression was that if there was any i don't think there was intentional faking period i think we're dealing can with you a, answer my the opinion, question linearly a genuine mentally ill person ma'am we were talking about linear sentences can we please get back to linear sentences because your sentence just had seven different branches can you please answer the question also, you've told us that most of the time when you deal with people who are psychotic and they have a, a episode or a violent outburst, there are other psychological symptoms. And her presentation was very unique and that it had no other symptoms. I have so many questions. Who occasionally is treated, takes medications. I don't think she's intentionally faking symptoms, even in the, in the test results. It, the she's test results show that she was you. exaggerating them, symptoms of a mental illness. However, Dr. Tracy Lucetta, in her report, I, I believe it's in her writer report, she points out that the majority of people with those feigning, malingering test results, they're later found out not to have been intentionally faking. Uh, when In your experience, in your training, do people sometimes who are going through a psychological evaluation or some kind of an assessment tend to overpresent? They want to put themselves in a good light. Sometimes I've I've done those tests. Yeah, and I've, I I every forensic evaluation, every I assess the person for malingering. Everyone I do. I don't necessarily give all the tests. Occasionally I do, but we have even other tests for just faking. What tests did and you I use? I sometimes use that, but. Yeah, sometimes people do that for various reasons. With regards to uh, Dr. Like Michelle. they've been arrested for murder? Could that be one of the reasons that maybe people would present differently on a test after it's determined that this is a defense that they are going to seek? Ma'am? You read the whole report, correct? Yes. And she had recommended transfer to one of the state psychiatric facilities like Mendota Mental Health or Winnebago, correct? Right, for testing, neuro, neuropsychological testing. And where and is the neuropsych report? Medications, yes. And, and before you wrote your July 3rd, 2023 report, you did consider um, all of the information, the interview on June 19th, the interviews in, uh, in February, is that true? Yes. And all the records, correct? Yes. And you're indicating to the court that uh, you did review some of the video clipped information between Mr. Business and the detectives? Yes. So you considered all of that information, correct? Yes. Your opinions aren't just based off of what happened on June 19th, correct? No. And as, as it relates to the uh, DSI, DSM-5 manual, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual hey. that psychologists use, um, you're familiar with the um, the elements for bipolar one? Yes. And did Taylor Shabazz exhibit some of those elements based some? on what you saw? Yes. And some? She confirmed Do she some had count? those experiences in the past, too. I thought you had to have all. And oftentimes when psychologists do testing, they would do the 
uh, MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, correct? Yes. It's a series of questions, correct? Today has been riveting. The short version is 300. <laughs> and then you gotta you got to answer these questions, and then you gather information from that, fair? Yeah, it's put into it. Nowadays, it's put into a computer. Ah, it's too much work. It's a computer test, right? Well, I don't know. I don't but, have the computer version. I don't know if it's all... I don't know how that works. Let me ask you this. With the, When's the last time uh, you gave test, the MMPI? The gold standard test for psychologists is the MCMI, correct? Yeah. The Milan Clinical Multi-Axial Inventory Test? Yes. Is that another written test? It is. Okay. It, was it your understanding that Dr. Matthew Seipel did not use the MMPI or the MCMI? No, he didn't <clears> use them. Other psychologists had already done that, correct? Right. And you reviewed those reports, correct? Yes. So you went right to it and got the materials and... Uh, analyze things from a psychological Doctor, standpoint. Right. I, I didn't think shorter. there was any utility, any use to giving her the whole test again when she had had it, I don't know, three, four times? It wasn't necessary. Is that fair? I didn't think so. No. In some of these records from Bellin, Ma'am, that's that not how you came a, across on cross examination. Yes, excuse me, Huffing Nail Polish no. in 2013. Yeah. Jack, it's outside the scope of cross. It's in the exhibit. It's in Exhibit 8. I can grab the exhibit, Your Honor. He said outside the scope of cross. We just want to be done. This is the defense's second and last witness. So after lunch, we should get into the prosecution's case. I have a feeling we're going to hear a lot more about the MMPI and what it is good for or not good for, why it why it can help detect malingering and not. And I think that uh, we know the direction that's going to go. Um, Nick... I appreciate you. Nick That's said, true, as right? a mental she health was, patient, uh, I am super horrified. Yes. Blah, blah, blah. About then, yes. It's wild. Your Honor, can I have Exhibit 7, <coughs> 8, 9, 10? Your Honor, can I have Exhibit 7, 8, 9, 10? I would like to read along. <coughs> yes, that's true. Uh, Jen said she has been doing this since the age of 14. She can just look at somebody and tell that they're psychotic, apparently. That's what she said. <laughs> Where is Christine? I know. <clears throat> um... With regards to business is like what the Bell and Psychiatric Center, well, her discharge summary, it does indicate uh, access one that she had a mood disorder, correct? I believe so, yes. Was that and, from the 2012? Yes. Yes. Will this at, really at, get at done today? At that time, it did talk uh, about could hallucinations, be tomorrow. correct? Yes, and, and when she came in, Doctor, they... Oh, yes. On, your, on his question, he asked if it referenced it. Yes. <laughs> the judge is like, I need you to answer what you're asked. Can you answer what you're asked? Can you answer answer what you're asked? I think the prosecutor did a good job of impeaching her. I think that and, uh, the prosecutor... And nine here, the Nicolay... The prosecutor is going to use the other experts mental health unit. more. The initial evaluation did indicate there was the bottom more needed. diagnosis was bipolar disorder, correct? Yes. And on the uh, Exhibit 10, fair to say that the final summary for Nicolay Psychiatric Center for Taylor Shabizas, she was admitted 322 of 2021, admitted with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, correct? That was one of them? Yes. And then she was discharged discharged um, April 12th of 2021, again with bipolar disorder as one of the dis discharge diagnoses, correct? <coughs> yes. And then on admission that her thought content showed that she appeared to be having auditory auditory hallucinations and delusions of persecution, correct? Yes. And suicidal ideation. I believe so, yes. Oh, yes. Do you... Uh... <clears throat> I know people have talked about this defendant having inappropriate facial responses, but I think all of us are kind of on the same page with this witness this afternoon. I don't and think they're inappropriate facial that, uh, based responses. On what you, like, I get it. Um, understood that Ms. Chavezas did not take her medications after she was released from Nicolay Psychiatric Center in April of 2021? Yeah, she did. that's my understanding. And that, what are you getting out of your, document, What are you doing, Her affect was flat? Yes. What does that mean, her affect was flat? Oh, sorry, I'm going to get a little cough drop here. That means that, I mean, facial expression is just emotionless, flat emotions. Is that a side effect of medication? Um, as it relates to these other exhibits, Exhibit 9, she was prescribed uh, Abilify for mood stabilization. Is that correct? Yes. And what was that one from? Is that, She's like, um, yes, the date but of wait, what? It indicates what? 323 of 21. 
So she that was, was Nicolay. A yes. Yeah, drop, she was she prescribed. Said. Yes, prescribed. Uh, the uh, first she was on Abilify, probably, I think when she came in, and then they switched her to the longer acting injected medicine just to make it easier. But then she didn't like it because it hurt. The injection hurt. Um, and at least at Nicolay, she was brought in. Uh, on an EM1 petition because she was hearing voices, correct? Yes. And she was seeing people who were not there. Is that correct? Yes. The prosecution is allowing the, um, the prosecution okay, no, is allowing the leading Administrative questions. Uh, Probably question be, about having a flat to affect be done. about the reported hallucinations about being brought in on a, on a, a chapter 51. That was upon admission into Nicolay, right? I, yes. When she was testing positive for methamphetamine and other substances. Right, substance use. Thank you, doctor. And that's the prosecution's no, point. Thank you. Thank you, the judge is like, we're done, right? We're done, I, right? I Thank fucking God, we're done. Uh, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Any objection to seven, eight, nine, and 10? No objection. Those will be received. Thank you. Your Honor, can I just make sure um, a lot of things are going on in my head? Did, were all my exhibits offered and accepted? Yes. Okay. The Exhibit defense five, attorney's not, like, I'll offer it. I'm trying. That witness was rough, sir. I know you don't get to uh, no. you don't get to choose her. Thank you, Judge. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our lunch break now. It is five after twelve. Yay! Uh, I ask that you get back to the jury room um, no later than one fifteen. I'd like to get up underway right at that time. All right. I'm gonna, as I do, I will take a quick break. I'm gonna answer some questions, and then we will also take a break during the lunch, and then be back as the jury gets back. <clears throat> I feel for this defense attorney. I really do. Because that, that was a mess. Your Honor, your mic. Um, I'm going to talk to my client, Your Honor, about whether I'm going to have Thank her you. testify. But other than that, no. Sure. I, I may not have her testify. I have to talk to her. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate that. And that's something I wanted to cover because um, in my in my research, uh, they tell judges that we, we don't necessarily have to make inquiry of, of a of a uh, defendant that's at this the, phase, but it's best practice says. to do so. And far be it for me to try to avoid best practice. So I think I would undertake that qualification or that um, the colloquy with your client when we return and when you advise me whether you have other witnesses. If if you're indicating after lunch that she would be your only witness and you don't intend to call her, then I'd have that colloquy before we bring the jury back in. Okay, just right. so everybody knows that. Thank you. Um, then um, the other thing I want the parties to take a look at, I'm going to provide you uh, after the uh, lunch break, jury instructions. is um, yeah. the proposed jury instructions. And I want to give you, I want you to give some thought to how uh, you want that laid out. My, my suggestion is that, and I'm open-minded on this, so I just want you to think about it and you can certainly push back a little bit if you want, that I would, I would give the, um, at the conclusion of evidence, I would give the uh, instruction 160 regarding closings. Then I would have you close then I would give a modified version of 100. That's the, the preliminary instruction indicating uh, to the jurors that I'll instruct them upon the principles of the law, that they shouldn't use any impression that they may have of my thoughts in any way, um, and yes, that they're yes. to follow the instructions that I give them. So I propose to give a modified 100. I'll modify it over the lunch hour, give it to you. You can take a look at it, and your response might be, I don't want you to give that at all, or I want you to modify it differently, but that I would give 100. I might give 315, Mr. Freilich. That is the instruction that if your client chooses not to testify, I could certainly give that instruction again. Um, although this is a civil matter and I'm not sure that it's really necessary, but um, that is a possibility. Then I would give uh, 640, which is uh, mental disease or defect expert opinion testimony, and 605, which is the instruction, um, the, the base instruction on this uh, proceeding. And then the jury would go into deliberations. That, that's what I would propose. I'll give you my draft of those instructions after lunch. You can think about it. We can have further conversation then. Anything else uh, before we break, Mr. Saunders? No. Mr. Fralick? There you are. Thank you. I'm okay. Um, then I'd ask you to be back in about an hour. That'll be 105. The jury will be back at 115. We can take up anything then. All right. We're in recess. Thank you. Lawyers get short lunches. It mm -hmm. looks like we're included in that with short lunches. Um, I'm bringing snacks for the afternoon because we're going to need snacks for the afternoon. She's like, I need some more water. Yeah. Well, wow. Um, this, this morning's testimony was something, uh, we've, we've learned a lot together. We've experienced a lot, but the clip, the, the, the moment that that doctor was just like, I don't need tests. I don't need tests. I almost 
fell out of my chair. Um, I have sour rope. That's what I've got for the afternoon. All right, let's get to let's get to questions real quick. You y'all are gonna need snacks for the afternoon. We have almost uh, sixteen thousand people in here, so thank you for that. If you're not subscribed, do the YouTube things. Go the you know all the YouTube all the YouTubey things. Let's get to a quick Q and A, and then I'm gonna take a break, get something to eat. We'll start an afternoon stream. I noticed that the performance is better just on uh the youtubes and on my computer if we if we break those in the middle and if Mikalina, if you will do that for um for 105 with the same um with the same thumbnail that would we'll just do that all right thank you very much let us get to a quick summary and q a shall we summary the defense's second well the defense is both of the defense's witnesses testified uh, this morning. The defense's second witness is now finished. The defense's second witness was their um, forensic psychologist who did not need any tests. She just looked at the defendant and said, that woman is psychotic. And that seems to be the heart of her testimony, though the defendant does have a mental health uh, history going back to the time that she was a teenager. I don't think that was easily presented um, by this expert and the cross-examination was illuminating. So there is the potentiality one of this defendant's malingering and over-presenting. And then there is the potentiality two that most of the symptoms that this defendant is experiencing are caused by the use of narcotics. And that is really what the prosecution's experts, I think we'll be getting into this afternoon. And that's what some of the reports indicated here. So we will hear much more about all of that testing this afternoon. I'm going to get to as many questions as I can, and then we will be uh, Zoom Zooming to get some lunch and then back here. All right, also, oh, I forgot to tell you. Also, if you want to be sure to stay in the loop with when I am going live, especially when we are in trial, lawnerdalert.com will We'll keep you in the loop. It is a free email list. I will let you know what I am doing, when we are streaming, what we are covering, and update you along the way of like, hey, the defendant's going to testify or whatever. This defendant could testify this afternoon because she's already been found guilty. So they've already they've already found her guilty of murder. She might not have much to lose in testifying this afternoon, and maybe we'll see. If she testifies, we're not going to be done with this today. Um, Stephanie said... TSQing the bipolar diagnosis is not uncommon, but also, uh, by the way, we mean Taylor should business, not Taylor Swift by TS. The chat uses TS interchangeably. No, we don't. T defendants um, questioning of the, di of the diagnosis is not uncommon, but she also says her behavior was because of drugs. It might be a way of saying, I don't need psych meds. Uh, couldn't that be evidence of manipulation? We'll see. How is it to show psychosis? I'm confused. We're going to see the other docs. Generally, you have to show it through testing, and we will see what happens there. Gingy Prob said, if I were looking for a defense witness that would be most favorable to the state, this would be the one. Is this grounds for appeal? No. Ineffective assistance? No. This is probably the person that they had. Um, this is probably the person that they had because, again, the state experts were the court appointed experts and the court appointed experts did not feel that this defendant has a mental disease or defect that would cause her to not perceive that she was committing a crime not be able to take responsibility for the crime and not be able to conform her behavior the defense has the witness that they just um put up and that's all that they have i take back what i said <laughs> she convinced me that she's as bad as dr spiegel i don't have to test yeah, Dr. Spiegel's like, ah, I was just watching like interviews on the news. We are all making the Taylor Shift business face now. I think everybody in the, everybody was just looking at this witness like this by the end. Um, and again, if you have if you have uh, watched trials on your own or watched trials with me where other forensic psychology testimony is presented, there is a a broad range of how helpful that testimony is. This was not presented in a, a helpful way for me. Uh if my memory is right sums up this witness perfectly i don't have to test uh yeah and i think the doctors that did test again the jury is going to want to see those tests more than this woman's perception the thing that stuck out the most to me was the comment that taylor shabiznes's presentation of her angry outburst was uh unique 
It's the only way she's seen it presented like that because the other psychotic episodes she had seen were, there were also physical manifestations. There were increased or rapid breathing, red in the face, like other manifestations of anger. And Taylor's business just like uh, hucked a chair and, and had a flat affect. It's interesting to see her present that way. Guess we're beyond eye roll. Now I'm heading into the weeds. This got wild this afternoon. Um, only one question for the prosecutors, the prosecution's expert claiming she business is not insane. Would you spend the night with her in a unit unguarded room? I don't know if they can ask that, but we'll see what they do. Um, ma'am, I have a master's in forensic psychology. Yes, it is the DSM-5. And yes, drugs can contribute to bipolar type tendencies. I know a lot of you in the chat are actually experts in the field and have a lot of deep frustrations with this witness. I feel you. Now you understand how I feel when I'm watching lawyers not lawyer uh, well, and you're just like, fuck, no. Music to my soul said I was annoyed and distracted by the wall clock clicking after my cochlear implant was activated in 2016. I asked the audiologist when I was going to start gaining um, sounds that weren't annoying. That's very fair. That would, that would be a lot to adjust to, I imagine. And your brain would be like, ooh, I hear it. And you're like, can we not though? Not that one. Other things, please. Brittany said, it's none of my business, but are they going to have another doctor do an evaluation? We are going to hear from other doctors that have done evaluations. Uh, Kelsey said, in my opinion, this expert is coming off as very lackluster with her opinions. It's reminding me of a weird combo of Elaine and Dr. Hughes. It was a, her opinions were very loose. They weren't for, it wasn't a, this, these things lead me to believe this, this, did not, I think, help the defense much, but I also think it's all that they have in this case. Um, I don't have a problem believing this woman is mentally uh, gone, says the super chat. I do have a problem with the possibility of her being released back into society, and I hate that I would base my decision on that. And we'll see what the jurors do. Um, and again, having antisocial tendencies, uh, committing crimes does not necessarily mean you can't perceive that what you did is wrong. And the Prosecution will probably argue in closing, she tried to hide it and you saw her conversation with the police and you saw how that worked. Did she really just say she does not do test? Yes. And she didn't watch the entirety of the defendant's videotaped interview. I think that, that that would be important for someone who's trying to say if at the time of the crime, this person was suffering from a mental disease or defect in the way that she should then be NGI, that she's not responsible for her behavior. You would think you would need to watch the whole thing, even if it meant driving to the public defender's office and picking up a CD with it. <sighs> so, the prosecution will have their own expert witness. Yes, I believe the prosecution has two. Those are the court appointed experts. The prosecution didn't hire them. They are using them. Um, is she trying to put us on the same purported mental state as the defendant? I now feel I've been <laughs> since this for years. It definitely gave me a headache. Uh, she business looks like she wants to throw another chair. I don't blame her. Midnight, I think most of the chat also is like, can this woman please stop talking? In my opinion, this expert isn't as bad as Amber Heard's expert, but people could convince me with the right arguments. <laughs> Discuss. Question, do public defenders have a good budget for experts? No. If not, we need to change that. No, they do not have a good budget for experts. It the court has the court has a list and the court has a set budget and they get paid under that court set budget. Um, but that happens in civil cases too. But no. Um, Nick said people having severe mental illness, in my opinion, are only hurt by this framing of information. I hallucinate, I have delusions, CPSD. CPTSD, bipolar, this is only creating more stigma. Nick, I, I hope that it doesn't, um, and I appreciate you sharing. Here's, here's why I hope that it doesn't. This is not, and this is where there's a push-pull about cases being public, right? This is framing in a very specific contest with a very, or content with a very specific goal. This is an adversarial proceeding where this defendant is trying to have a jury determine that because of her particular situation, they should have her in a mental health facility where she has the opportunity to get out in the future versus in a prison. So the context here is very, very specific. The things that these doctors are arguing can't be kind of taken out into the broader world as it were, but it doesn't help when, when, crimes are blamed on mental illness without evidence of such. 
However, this defendant does have a pretty long history. Um, and that is, that is something. So the jury's going to have to decide that and decide what is the, what is the just result here? Like what is justice here with regard to this defendant? Hopefully that helps. Bella Bratt said, when our frame of reference is Dr. Curry, everyone else pales in comparison. That's true. Maybe it should be a requirement for Dr. Curry to do voiceovers of future testimony. Um, I, I, I will be very interested to see what Dr. Curry thinks of this woman being just like, what? I don't think she would ever comment on that publicly. Uh, many of the medications mentioned have off-label usage. I was on one of them in my teens for ADD, ADHD. Uh, prosecution needs to point this out. They might. How is off-label medication use argued in court? It depends on whether the experts bring it up. The prosecution might not get into it much because the prosecution's argument is she didn't have she didn't have these symptoms when she was not on meth, and that is going to be the difference. They are going to be arguing that the methamphetamine use is the bigger problem here, not an underlying diagnosis. So that's really what it's going to be with this. So with all of that, you guys, um, we have been streaming for about four hours. We have just about a half an hour left. Um, I am sorry that I didn't get to every single question. I have to go get something to eat. I will be back with you at 105 when the court takes up any issues and I will answer some more questions then too. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being law nerds. You guys are the best chat on the internet. Uh, go get some food, get some snackies. We'll probably be here till 5 p.m. So we've got another like four hour stint this afternoon and I will do a summary right at the beginning. So with that law nerds, uh, hydrate, snackies. I'll see you in a few. You can find all the Law Nerd goodies at lawnerdshop.com. Connect with me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. And don't forget to check out my podcasts, The Emily Show, and the new podcast, Quick Bits, summarizing everything I talk about on my Tuesday and Thursday live streams. You know, when you only have time for just the Quick Bits.